Let's start, Ken. Okay, so good afternoon, uh, everyone who is in the Malaysian time zone and good morning to everyone else. Uh, and good day to everyone else who is from all the other town, uh, time zones. Uh, welcome to the Decarbonization and Ecolo Ecological Approach uh, webinar by the Episcopal Commission for Creation Justice of Malaysia, Singapore and Brunei. So before we begin this webinar, here are a few house rules that we kindly request you to follow. The first one is to please mute yourself uh, at all times during the whole webinar. The second one is to please rename yourselves uh, as follows with your your name and the country that you're from, so that we know where you are logging in from or following this webinar from. Um, please do not switch your camera on to save bandwidth, uh, except for when we are taking a group photo uh, before we commence the webinar proper. And then finally, if you have any questions, please write them in the chat box. Uh, at the end of the four uh, presentations, we will have a Q&A session uh, and we'll try to pick up as many questions as possible. However, due to time constraints, we may not be able to answer all the questions here. So please leave your questions and your email in the chat box. We'll pick it up and forward it to the speakers and they will reply to you by email when they are able to. Thank you very much. So if we are all ready to begin, I would like to start by um, handing over to Ms. Claire Westwood, uh, who will do the introductions. Over to you, Claire. Thank you so much, Kennedy. Good afternoon. Recording Good in progress. Good evening to everyone from Malaysia and beyond our shores. Thank you so much for being part of this webinar by the Episcopal Commission for Creation Justice of Malaysia, Singapore, and Brunei. To begin, I'd like to call upon our Bishop Joseph He, who is the president of the Episcopal Commission for Malaysia, Singapore, and Brunei to deliver his welcoming address. Welcome, uh, Bishop Joseph. Thank you, Clay. Dear friends and lovers, protector of Mother Nature, from within and outside Malaysia. At the outset, allow me to welcome all of you to this webinar. We are so happy that you have chosen to be with us today as we explore ways to save our planet from destruction. I especially welcome our valuable uh, speakers, panels of speakers, moderators, and participants, especially from outside Malaysia. We are truly honored to have you with us this afternoon or this morning or this evening. The world stands at the tipping point in human history. Never before has the human race faced such an existential threat as it does today. The irony is that it is a problem that we ourselves have created. Climate change is simply telling us that we have transgressed our boundaries. We should not have, and it has given us ample warning over decades that we had to stop. These warnings we have largely failed to heed in the time leading us to 1.1 degrees Celsius of warming today with accompanying disasters causing widespread misery and devastation. We are showing what we have read. The science is telling us that we are in a caught red situation and that we have only a small window of time to stop global heating from 
passing 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is due to happen within the next decade. At current greenhouse gas emission rates. So how shall we pursue this small window of opportunity to prevent dangerous climate change from escalating to catastrophic climate change? There seems to be many solutions to put forward by different sectors, scientists, governments, private sector, civil society, religious bodies, which of these are true and which are false. In 2015, the leader of the Catholic Church, Pope Francis, wrote a letter to the world called Lautato Si, appealing for all people of good faith and goodwill to come together to protect our common home, a home that was given to us and which has nurtured us faithfully for eons. Sadly, we have not been faithful stewards to it. In paragraph 49 of the Laudato Si, Pope Francis writes, a true ecological approach always becomes a social approach. It must integrate questions of justice in debates on the environment, so as to hear both the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. I believe all people of good faith, whether Catholic, Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, Sikh, or simply people who care for the common good, all want an ecological approach. Ecology, ecology focuses on the relationship we have with our nature, social and built environments. Because climate change is a problem that is rooted in a global economic and technocratic system that is unjust. Extractive, oppressive, and destructive. We need to pursue pathways that are just, equitable, compassionate, and life-giving, especially to the marginalized, both human and in our nature. We need to change now for the sake of current and future generations of all life on Earth. The webinar is a humble initiative of the Roman Catholic Church of Malaysia to do its part to support Malaysia as she transitions towards a decarbonized, resilient, more just economy. The Episcopal Commission of Creation Justice of Malaysia, Singapore and Brunei has been working on advancing creation justice and resilience since 2017. And of this year, we have focused our attention on decarbonization. We believe reducing our carbon footprint is essential in our taking accountability for the global climate emergency. I would like to extend my sincere appreciation to all those who have supported and contributed to this webinar in one way or another, especially our esteemed panels of speakers, the moderators today, 
I also thank the organizing committee for their hard work. It is my prayer that we will all benefit from what the speakers have to share with us today so that we may truly undertake ecological solutions towards decarbonization, not just in Malaysia, but in all our countries. Let us now keep moments of silence to pray or to just feel the wonders of the beauty of nature that we feel the all wonders of nature that is present among us at this moment. We pray or we ask inspiration to make use of all the panels of speakers as instrument to inspire all the listeners here at this moment that it may touch our hearts to really love and care for our mother nature. For the sake of our future, our present and future generations. Thank you very much, Bishop Joseph He, for that inspiring, welcoming address. And now I'd like to give a short introduction about why the Roman Catholic Church of Malaysia is organizing a webinar like this. And so I'll allow me to share screen. Why are we focusing on decarbonization and how is it connected to our mission? Uh, we believe that it's not just the mission of the church, it's the mission of all faiths. All faiths are embedded uh, in a respect for creation. All faiths call upon all human beings to be good stewards of creation. So, as Bishop alluded to just now, we are at a tipping point. The world is an ecological crisis, which is climate, environmental, social, political, economic, cultural, spiritual, and relational in nature. We have ruptured our relationship with one another, uh, between the haves and the haves not, between the rich and the poor. We have ruptured our relationship with nature. We could continue with business as usual, continue emitting, denying the climate crisis. According to scientists, we could Best case to worst case scenario, we could hit up to over five degrees by 2100. Along the way, this would entail immense widespread injustice and suffering, even more than what we're seeing today, and eventually destruction, destruction and death of species, including possibly in the human species. Or we could change our ways now. We've been trying to do it for the past 30 years and without much success. Reduce our greenhouse gas emissions dramatically enough to stop at least stop around 1.5 and not take the world to two degrees, three degrees, four degrees or five degrees. Fight for justice and resilience for both people and mother earth. And then that will give future generations hope for a life worth living on a planet that is still sustainable. So what's at stake are the innocent lives, like the poor all over the world, especially in the global South. Innocent creation is also at stake. They are voiceless. They are the last, the least, and the lost as well. And children, are we doing everything in our power to make the world safe for our children? And it doesn't matter whether you're really a parent or not, all children are ours to protect and to care for. So Pope Francis, um, as Bishop said earlier, wrote this encyclical letter in 2015 to target the Paris Agreement of the UNFCCC in Paris that year in 2015. And he came to three conclusions. Uh, in Ladatu Si. The first is that he said, we are reaching breaking point. Mind you, this was seven years ago. 
The present world system is certainly unsustainable. In layman's language, business as usual is not an option in the church, in any sector, in the economy, in development, and that humanity has disappointed God's expectations. In every faith, God always ex has expected us to be good, responsible, compassionate stewards of creation, and we have not done that. And he also talked about the human roots of the ecological crisis, the structural causes being a global economic model that is destructive, extractive, unfair, unjust, and oppressive. And the technocratic paradigm where technology is king, not people. Of course, all this is rooted in excessive anthropocentrism, meaning that human beings think that we are God. We have all the power. We can do as we like, when we like, to whoever or whatever we like. Greed, selfishness, self-centeredness, a lack of self-awareness, indifference, denial, and weak political will. And he called for an ecological conversion to a culture of accountability for us to reflect on what is the harm we have done, what is the harm we have allowed to happen, and what is the good that we have failed to do. And this is for everyone. It is not tied to any particular religion, any person of good faith. And as Bishop also said just now, he talked about a true ecological approach, always becoming a social approach and integrating questions of justice and hearing the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor who are suffering the worst impacts of the climate crisis. And he gave certain mandates to the church. He said, many things have to change course, but it is we human beings above all who need to change. And the work of the church seeks not only to remind everyone of their duty to care for nature, but above all, she must protect mankind, humankind, from self-destruction. Because we, this crisis is of our making. It is not a natural crisis. It is made by humans. And this is why the Episcopal Commission for Christian Justice of Malaysia, Singapore, Brunei, set up by the Bishop's Conference of Malaysia, Singapore, and Brunei, is dedicated to the vision of people living in oneness with all creation, upholding creation justice with a mission to advance Christian justice or ecological justice and resilience with two objectives, building a movement of ecological citizens because we can't do this alone. None of us can do this alone. We need to band together. We need to come together as one human family. And we need to create living pathways of creation justice and resilience so that we don't just talk. Young people can see that this is viable. There are viable pathways. There are better ways of being and doing. And what is creation or ecological justice? It is justice for all life on earth, recognizing that all living creatures have the right to live with dignity. It acknowledges the interconnection and interdependence of all beings, including natural entities in the earth community, and acknowledges that we humans are meant to live as one with all other living beings, and we carry a special responsibility to care for them with love and compassion. And of course, resilience, uh, we have to protect earth resilience. And also we have to build community resilience to, uh, to face a climate challenge future with courage, competence, and hope. So resilience entails the ability to withstand shocks, whether those shocks are slow onset or fast onset, whether they're floods or droughts or food shortages, the capacity to recover quickly after a shock to the original state and the capacity to still grow and thrive in spite of shocks. And we need to prepare all communities, especially in the global south, especially those who are most vulnerable to climate change to build this sort of resilience. So the commission employs four strategies. The first is to build leadership and capacity to spearhead and drive this process and mission because it is a fairly new topic for, for many of us. And so without building capacity, they will not know how to incorporate um, climate action into what they're doing. It involves immense awareness raising and empowerment through ecological education to nurture a strong ecological spirituality that recognizes the oneness, the oneness between us and all living things and to integrate it into everything else that we're doing because climate permeates everything. Building an ecological movement and developing ecological models of dialogue, interaction, development and governance that are truly life-giving and not life-destroying, and establishing ecological focal points of hope and resilience. Again, I was mentioning just now that we actually have pathways uh, to showcase and to, to follow through on. Like uh, many parishes have set up urban food gardens 
Um, it could also be cleaning up your river in your locality. It could be protecting a forest reserve. It could be planting mangroves. It could be a recycling or repurposing center in the parish or in your organization. And so the ecological church has to focus on five key areas. One is to build leadership for um, among everyone. Everyone can be a leader in taking ecological action. And this involves ecological education. It involves building the ecological movement and of course advocacy, where we feel that uh, those in power are not taking enough action or the right action. It involves building resilience and it involves taking accountability because conversion starts with myself. It starts with ourselves before we try to convert others. And this is based on our faith or whatever our faith may be, this strong ecological spirituality that respects all of creation. So this is us, this webinar is one step in us taking accountability where we seek to support, to promote, to facilitate a just transition to an equitable, resilient, regenerative and decarbonized economy in the country through three strategies, education, so people know why they have to decarbonize, to capacitate in case, so that they know how to, for instance, transition to clean energy, they know how to build resilience and to collaborate. Uh, this webinar again is an example of collaboration within the church and with our sisters and brothers outside as well. And for instance, we are also having a campaign later in this year. It is the Protect Our Earth, Protect Our Children campaign. Uh, this year's theme will be cut fuel consumption, targeting transport fuel consumption, which will be celebrated, which will be carried out and promoted in all dioceses in Malaysia. So my last slide is this. I will end with this burning question. For things to change, who must change? We, all, we don't want this um, horrible, destructive, three degree, four degree, future. We want things to be better. Pope Francis writes in Lada to see, all it takes is one good person to restore hope. Today, my sisters and brothers, I give you 10 good persons who I believe will restore your hope that we can rebuild our world, we can reclaim our future, and we can redeem our dignity. Two moderators and eight speakers from Malaysia, from Indonesia, from the Philippines, from India, and from the United Kingdom. Um, these 10 people have got three special qualities, competence, courage, and their real superpower is how much they care. I've known some of them for many years, some of them more recently, but I do know that some of them have dedicated decades of their lives to fighting the good fight for justice. They have endured critique, attack, ridicule, but they have pushed ahead and they are formidable in their advocacy for justice for everyone, especially the marginalized. Because of their efforts and their dedication, I have hope. I have hope for the world. And we have a fighting chance for, to save this planet from destruction. And so as you listen to them, I ask you not just to open your ears and just think, listen to information. I ask you to look beyond, listen with your whole minds and your whole hearts and your whole beings to see the spirit with which they are sharing this knowledge with you. The love that they carry in their hearts, that's their real superpower. It is a superpower that is available to all of us. Because as we open our hearts and we change from within, that is where the redemption of the world lies. The world has to change from within, not from without. So I give you these 10 wonderful people, these 10 really good people who will take you on this journey. And I pray at the end that it will inform your minds, touch your hearts and inspire you to ecological action. So that all of us, every single one of us, can be good people who restore hope. This is my email. If you wish to contact uh, the Creation Justice Commission, please write to me. Thank you very much. I pass it back to your first moderator, Kennedy Michael. Thank you very much, Claire, for an introduction to Decarbonizing Malaysia. So before we go into the uh, speaking sessions, uh, first I'd like to ask all of you to turn on your cameras so that we can take the group photograph uh, of today's event. Are we ready to take a photo?
So we'll probably have to pan a number of pages uh, to get everyone in. So I'm going to hand it over to Audrey, who will be taking the photo uh, to tell you when to smile. Can't seem to get any response from Audrey. Do we know if she's done the photos? Yes, Kennedy, I'm taking. I'm just waiting for everyone to switch on. So I realize that some are not switching. It's okay, you can go ahead, Audrey. Just maybe they can't. All right, all done. Okay, so uh, that's good. Thank you very much, everyone, for turning on your cameras. You can now switch off your cameras. And we'll go into uh, the first part of today, which is to introduce myself. So hi, my name is Kennedy Michael. I am the co-founder and communications coordinator of the Malaysian Climate Emergency Coalition, or Government Direct Claim Malaysia. So Government Direct Claim Malaysia was formed in 2021 by a group of NGOs and individuals, and we were centered around the need or the attempt to get the Malaysian government to declare a climate emergency. We worked for almost a year to produce the starting point uh, of which um, could be a roadmap for the Malaysian government to take, and we handed the letter of demand to them in 2022. And then again, uh, earlier this year, uh, there seems to be some positive effect from that if you follow the news um, where uh, the government has taken an uh, interest in declaring a climate emergency or at least uh, working on a climate change act. So that's uh, about me. We are now going to go into our session itself uh, and I'd like to introduce our first uh, speaker. So just give me a second to pull this up. So our first speaker for today will be uh, Ms. Uh, Minakshi Raman. So Mina is um, someone that Claire was talking about who has worked for decades uh, in, the, in the fields of social justice. Uh, she's someone I have tremendous respect for. She represents uh, Sabat Alam Malaysia, Friends of Earth Malaysia, and is our go-to expert on climate change. Mina also worked on the document with us, uh, and she represents Malaysia on various fronts. She also is a, a lawyer, a practicing lawyer, and, uh, and is the advocate and solicitor for the Consumers Association of Penang. Please welcome Ms. Mina Shirabi. Over to you, Mina. Thank you very much, Kennedy, um, Bishop, um, Claire, and all of you. Um, greetings. Um, like what Pope Francis had said, um, you know, we are at breaking point. And Antonio Guterres, the UN Secretary General on Climate Change last year, very clearly said that we are on a highway to hell um, with our foot on the accelerator. Um, so this is really something that is uh, frightening. Next slide, please. Um, well, I think we already know this, but just to make clear again, underscore the fact that uh, climate change is already happening. We are feeling the uh, uh, you know, heat waves, we are feeling the temperature rise. Um, we are also seeing droughts, we are also seeing floods, and the global warming refers to the rise in temperatures uh, related to the rising greenhouse gases. Um, and we already know that human activities are responsible for 1.1 degree world already today. And fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas are the largest contributor to climate change, accounting for 75% of global greenhouse gas emissions and nearly 90% of all carbon dioxide emissions. Next, please. Um, now, the impact of global warming um, at a 1.5 degree world compared to pre-industrial levels, if you compare that to a two degree world, of course, if we are able to live, stay within 1.5, what we would see is less extreme weather where people living, including um, in extreme heat and rainfall, by 2100, this is the IPCC saying this, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, Global mean sea level rise will be around 10 centimeters lower, but may continue to rise for centuries. 10 million fewer people are exposed to risk of rising seas. Lower impact on biodiversity and species. 
smaller reductions in yields of maize and rice. Um, global population exposed to increased water shortages is up to 50% less compared to a two degree world, or lower risk to fisheries and livelihoods, and uh, up to 700 million fewer people who will be susceptible. Next uh, slide, please. Um, so impacts at the food level, you, this is a sl um, some slides to show you the range of what happens in a 1.5 degree world, a two degree world, and a three degree world, and four degree world. Then you have the impacts on flora and fauna. I'm not gonna go into all the details, you can have a look, but what is clearly um, obvious is that the lesser the temperature rise compared to pre-industrial levels, the more there is hope in the world. And the more that it, the temperature rises, the less hope there is in this world. Next slide, please. Um, what is significant is that there is a limited carbon budget left to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. Now, what we need to understand is that the, inter the IPCC itself has already shown that there is only about 500 gigatons of carbon space left with a 50%, only a 50% chance of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees C. And the world is already emitting around 43 gigatons every year, which means that the window that uh, Claire was talking about, we have only about 11 to 12 years and that budget will be exhausted and we'll bust the temperature rise to be beyond 1.5. Now, if the carbon budget is be made more stricter to only be 400 gigatons of carbon, that only takes us to a 67% chance of meeting the 1.5 degrees. Next, please. So the current trends of emissions, if not addressed, are leading us to a worse off world. And if you look at the slides, it's very clear. Um, no climate policies will take us to 4.1 to 4.8. Current policies take us to 2.5 to 2.9 degrees. And we are already at 1.1. And so it's really, really, really very, very scary that time is running out on us. Next, please. So what, what is critical to understand is that from historical emissions, we have to take into account historical emissions. We cannot just talk about current emissions because the Annex One countries, which is actually the developed world, the industrial countries, they became rich. After, you must remember, they colonized us. They, they um, could emit and depend on fossil fuels without any constraint. And with only between 1850 to 1990, their share of global emissions was 71% when they only had a population of 18%. And if you look at um, the current, there are emissions share is 46% and uh, with, with a smaller population. And for all developing countries, the colonized world and post-colonial world, we are only uh, have about um, the share in the historical years was only 29%. And the share is much larger today at 54%. And we have 82% of the world's population. And that's why our global and our, our share of the emissions are large, particularly due to large populations in India and China, who through no fault of theirs, you know, they have uh, populations which are large. Next, please. So the developed world with only 25% of population has overused the carbon budget. Absolutely important to remember. A global just transition demands that the world's biggest historic polluters, first among them the United States, take immediate action to wind down fossil fuel production and reject false solutions peddled by fossil fuel tycoons. It took a long time and even today there is large amount of denial of climate science, particularly in the Trump era. And we are understanding that Trump might make a comeback. So you can imagine what the world will be like. Now, instead of reducing rapidly and phasing out fossil fuels, they are still expanding fossil fuel production, embarking on false solutions like net zero and carbon trading and so on. So although President Biden in initially pledged to ban oil and gas leasing on public lands and waters, he issued drilling permits at a rate faster than Trump during his first year in office. So this is, this is ridiculous. Next, please. So the rich nations owe reparations to countries. And this is what um, Pakistan was already saying, the Pakistan minister, we are at 1.15 C already now. 
And much of these impacts we are seeing today are due to historical emissions um, as carbon dioxide remains very long in the atmosphere between three to 1,000 years. And so you can see that they are responsible for a lot of this. And if they take a very long time and continue to delay action, the world is in a much worse place. Next, please. Loss and damage finance. This is very critical. The amount of money that is mounting in terms of needing even today, as you saw from the Pakistan, horrible, horrible, what they call biblical proportions of floods, one third of the economy wiped out. Here you see the rise in uh, uh, estimates of what um, climate, climate finance will be for loss and damage alone, not taking into account mitigation and adapting to climate change. It's really, really in the going into the billions and the trillions. Next, please. Um, so the first principles that we have to recognize is that um, climate justice is underpinned by historical responsibilities and fair shares be, be based on cumulative emissions, limited carbon budget, equitable sharing of the atmospheric and development space, taking into account per capita emissions, the principle of common but differentiated responsibility, which is res uh, between the North and the South, which is recognized in the convention, framework convention on climate change and the Paris Agreement. And this requires developed countries to also provide the technology transfer and the climate finance and the capacity building in terms of international obligations. And that the real solutions have to be based on real solutions and just transitions and not false solutions. We need to phase out fossil fuels transition in a in low carbon pathways, which are just and equitable. It cannot be further burdening the poor. I like the call about crying for nature and crying for the poor. The poor should always be in the center of the solutions. And evidence shows that indigenous peoples and local communities with secure land riot, riot, rights vastly outperform both government and private landholders in preventing deforestation, in conserving biodiversity, and producing food sustainably. And there are many community-based initiatives which are already underway, which have to be recognized and upscaled, actually. Next, please. Um, net zero does not mean uh, zero. I think we need to understand this. What really um, is, is, is a big fantasy, which is being, I call it, I call it a false myth that was propagated in Glasgow at the um, UK COP, the whole notion of net zero. The Paris Agreement actually talks about a global net zero, which means in total, everybody's actions must lead to net zero by 2050 about emissions, reducing emissions, increasing the things. But what Glasgow did was net zero for all. So all countries began to say, we will do net zero. For the developed world, you have no budget left to do a net zero uh, by 2050. It's doing too little, too late, and the temperature goal will go sky high. Uh, next slide, please. So this notion of scope one, scope two, scope three, I don't have time to go through all that. But just to say that this whole notion of net zeros is not near real zero. The other false solution is on carbon offsets. The thing that you, you've been told that, oh, okay, we can, when we fly, we take airlines, we will pay the airline, and then we will the airline will go and plant a tree and therefore our fossil fuel emissions are offset. Now, there is no more room for carbon offsets. The offsetting idea is a false solution. And also it's not even based on science. You can't imagine that the fossil fuel emissions can be substituted by the, the, the biomass carbon. Um, and and you know, you're just going to sequester and therefore you know, everything is hunky-dory. Next, please, next slide. So this is especially, wait, just go back one, Audrey. Just go back, yeah. This is contentious when forest carbon offset is used to justify and continue expansion pol and pollution of the fossil fuel industry. Forests are not able to absorb the massive amount of additional carbon in the atmosphere coming from the fossil fuel industry. Next slide, please. So you have this whole ESG, and we, have, that's, we need another program to talk about this. But this whole ESG about environment, sustainability, and governance, now, in the, in the, what we call this is green capitalism. In the market, in the green corporations, in, I mean, so-called green corporations, which are not green at all, they are beginning to look at nature as a new asset class. So some are calling this the Wall Street takeover of nature because what they are doing is they create a new asset class and then they are putting it on the stock exchange and they're asking for, for investments into it. And so this is really a big um, financialization of nature 
which many of us are saying it's not for it's totally false and bogus. Next, please. Um, so this is just an example where a U.S. firm um, is planning to actually dr uh, instead of drilling, allowing for drilling of oil, is beginning to um, sell carbon and biodiversity credits in, in in the gorilla habitat in the Congo Basin. Now, many African countries are now tempted by this. Even Malaysia is tempted by this, that there's going to be payment for you to keep your forest. But then the issue really is um, whose forests are these? Whose uh, nature is this? Whose gorillas are this? And what are you doing this for? Is it really to continue to offset and therefore continue pollution? I think these are very important questions. Next slide, please. Um, a particular report called the Land Gap Report actually showed that the total, oh no, no, you're too fast, Audrey, that the total area of land needed to meet the projected biological carbon removal in the national climate pledges under the Paris Agreement is almost equal to 1.2 billion hectares, which is larger than the United States of America and almost four times the area of India. So that's the amount of land offsets that that and in, in the forest that these pledges are talking about and even more concerning is that over half of the land needed to fulfill the climate mitigation pledges requires a land use change through plantations and establishing new areas devoted exclusively to forests which will compromise the rights of indigenous peoples other human rights livelihoods and food sovereignty including the ability of local communities and small order for farmers to feed themselves. So this whole um, food versus carbon sinks is a big, big, big issue. Next, please. So the non-negotiables. Unfairly, the impacts of climate change are falling disproportionately on developing countries, the marginalized and the poor, com poor communities, despite the fact that they contribute the least to the causes. False solutions only serve to perpetuate climate crisis while benefiting big polluters often violating the rights of indigenous peoples and low, local communities. Real com solutions require deep and rapid greenhouse gas emissions reduction, adapt to the impacts of climate change and address the loss and damage while upholding the rights of communities, justice and equity in the process. Now, um, as I've said, indigenous peoples and local communities have started taking measures. We have a paper book here produced by Sabah Dala Malaysia in many of the Sarawak communities are also involved in many of the communities in the peninsula already doing this is not enough, nowhere very enough. But I, but as um, Claire said, these are messages of hope and people who have to be empowered to actually bring the solutions of the real change that we need. The final slide I think is um, uh, community different solutions. Uh, let's go to the last slide. And in, if you do need further information, you can go on to TWN. And we have a book called The Clash of Paradigms uh, written by my uh, by Martin Kaur, who is no longer with us, but an inspirer to many of us and myself on the history of the negotiations, which actually showed a clash of a fight between the North and the South, which continues till today. So thank you very much. I am sorry that I had to condense everything so fast and uh, uh, we'll be happy to entertain questions later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mina, for that uh, insight into the non-negotiables uh, of decarbonization, not just here in Malaysia, but also around the world. Uh, we'd like now to present our next speaker, uh, and the topic is a critical look at false solutions, that critical look at false solutions to the climate crisis. Please uh, welcome Ms. Alinita, uh, as she's fondly known, Neth. Dano. Nat is the Asia Director and Coordinator of the Action Group on Erosion, Technology and Concentration, the ETC Group, an international CSO that monitors the impacts of emerging technologies and corporate strategies on biodiversity, agriculture and human rights. Nat has represented environmental non-governmental organizations in the advisory board of the Climate Technology Center and Network, CTCN, of the UNFCCC and in global environmental governance discussions at the UN environment. She was appointed for a two year term by the UN Secretary General in the 10 member group that supports the UN technology facilitation mechanism. Nat is based in the Philippines and has a bachelor's degree in development studies and a graduate degree in community development from the University of the Philippines. Over to you, Nat.
Uh, Ned, could you unmute your microphone, please? Hello, Ned. Uh, you are muted. Would you unmute your mic? Thank you. Okay. I'm sorry about that. Really sorry. I was actually already speaking, thinking that I was already um, being heard. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. You can take okay. it from the top. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you again, Kennedy for the kind introduction and to Bishop Joseph and to Claire and the team for the invitation and for organizing this webinar this afternoon. I've been asked to speak on the critic, on a critical look at false solutions to the climate, climate crisis. And I thank Mina uh, for mentioning some of the false solutions, even elaborating on the meta-narrative that is net zero, which I will also um, um, tackle, but not deeply because of the time limitation. I think it's better that we um, define what false solutions are um, to the climate crisis because this has been referred to time and again, mentioned, but it's good to start um, um, in, in defining what we mean by false solutions. Uh, most of them are actually technological solutions that do not address the root causes of the climate crisis. That's the common denominator. Um, they don't address the root causes. Um, these are so-called solutions that allow polluters to continue polluting or emitting greenhouse gases through means that actually avoid real emissions cuts. And they are primarily short-sighted measures that are meant to create illusions of solutions, quote-unquote, while earning profits or continuing to earn profits from fossil fuel production in the whole industry and or providing pro-climate, pro-environment image to proponents. I just would like to cite this um, reference in a publication of Friends of the Earth that, that came out in COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh in November. They actually identified net zero, carbon markets, carbon offsets and removal, nature-based solutions and geoengineering as false solutions that allow polluters to continue polluting, doing everything but real emissions cuts. I think Mina has also referred to that in her presentation. Just to mention a few and also to define a few of these meta narratives. Uh, by meta narratives, you mean this uh, body of knowledge, history, or framing that is actually meant to um, to advance um, certain certain experience or certain um, historical meaning that offers legitima legitimation. Um, through anticipated com completion of master ideas. So these are actually master ideas that we've been hearing, like we've heard of climate smart agriculture. I'd like to emphasize that the, the dominant definition of climate smart agriculture came from the World Bank. Um, it's an integrated approach to managing landscapes, cropland, livestock, that addresses the interlinked challenges of food security and accelerating climate change, very broad, and I think it's meant to be broad. Same with nature-based solutions. There is no common definition under the UN. Even climate smart agriculture has no common definition under the UN. It's actually IUCN that actually defined um, nature-based solutions in their documents. And they said that these are actions to protect, sustainable manage, restore natural and modified ecosystems that address societal challenges effectively and adaptively, simultaneously benefiting people and nature. Again, very broad um, definition which has been interpreted and reinterpreted in the past three, five years since nature-based solutions have been uh, put forward in UN discussions. And all, of course, net zero, as Mina explained in two of her slides, um, that the nature, the net zero coalition, which actually comprise of businesses, private sector, um, some NGOs, and also some governments, um, define net zero as the means of cutting greenhouse gas emissions to as close to zero as possible with any remaining emissions reabsorbed from the atmosphere by oceans and forests, for instance. I think the broadness and breadth of the definition allows interpretation, reinterpretation, and also like even for instance, for example, actually expands um, how the definition can be um, stretched. And one of the, the um, most prominent um, false solutions that is actually being advanced um, in many 
in many discussions is actually climate geoengineering. And even climate geoengineering is even advanced under the, the, the broad narrative of net zero and also nature-based. I'll, I'll explain this in some of the technologies. Just to um, again define, um, as we will hear this, as we are actually hearing this more and more, um, geoengineering is actually a set of technologies um, to intentionally intervene in and alter earth systems on a large scale, mega scale even, particularly to manipulate the climate or earth systems to counteract some of the effects of climate change. Right from the definition, geoengineering is a techno fix for climate change and much of the, the symptoms, much of the, the technologies and techniques actually just address the symptoms, but none of them actually address the root causes. There are actually dozens of proposed geoengineering techniques, which I will not go into because it will take a webinar um, to do that. And all of them are actually um, targeting either terrestrial ecosystems, marine and coastal or ocean and or the atmosphere. There are this um, slide which comes from Britannica, Encyclopedia Britannica actually identifies some of these proposed geoengineering techniques. And the most controversial, of course, are those that are involving um, the bombardment of sulfur aerosols in the atmosphere to block the sun, so to keep the temperature down. And the most um, oft repeated in many of the, of the discourses are actually some are, are to do with uh, carbon dioxide removal. But the common denominator is none of these geoengineering te techniques aim to address the root causes of climate change. They aim to partially counteract some of its symptoms like warming, also um, sucking of carbon dioxide, but partial. Um, none of them could actually um, offer solutions that would address root causes. And the underlying drivers of climate change would continue unaffected such as unsustainable industrial uh, production, growing unequal consumption, deforestation, and sustainable agriculture. So again, without addressing root causes, climate change will continue to worsen. I will just um, go into some of the most um, uh, awfully repeated and referred to and highly um, controversial geoengineering technologies that are inter uh, done in terrestrial ecosystems that would be very, um, relevant in the whole decarbonization um, discourse. Um, I'll, I'll talk about direct air capture, carbon capture and storage, and carbon capture use and storage, or CCUS, CCS, CCUS, and bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. CCS, as you may have heard, is actually a suite of technologies that claim to capture up to 90% of the carbon dioxide emissions produced from the use of fossil fuels in electricity generation, cement production, and other industrial processes, preventing the carbon dioxide from entering the atmosphere. This is the claim. Um, the CCS in general actually consists of capturing the carbon, transporting the carbon, because most of the time, the storage um, of carbon dioxide is not in the site where carbon dioxide is captured. So it involves transport, which could actually involve transboundary um, implications. And lastly, securing um, the storage of carbon dioxide underground, mostly in depleted oil and gas fields or deep saline aquifer formations. Um, this is an example of that um, graphic um, describing what I have um, described, uh, um, presenting what I have described. And it's largely based on the assumption that geological storage of carbon, especially in old oil and gas reservoir, are actually reliable and permanent. There are, there are a lot of controversies on CCS uh, models and pilots that already that, that exist, um, including leakage in such um, established and most expensive CCS project in Canada, in the North Sea, in Norway, and also in Algeria. There are only existing large-scale bioenergy CCS project. Um, it's actually in Decatur um, in, in the U.S. Um, involving corn ethanol refinery um, in Illinois. Um, it's all by, owned by Archer Daniel in Midlands. And it involves injecting um, carbon dioxide in, the near, in a nearby sandstone formation. There are a lot of CCS, um, small scale CCS that exist. Most of them about enhanced oil recovery, which is actually uh, pumping carbon dioxide in old oil wells to extract more carbon dioxide and release them into the atmosphere. 
Uh, but in large scale, none of them is actually proven economic, economically or technically and ecologically viable despite the hype about CCS. There's also another form that involves bioenergy, largely operating around the, the capture, transport, and storage um, chain that I mentioned about. Um, it's called BEX. And BEX is actually bio, or bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. It's actually been um, touted as part of the solution in some of the scenarios that are even projected in IPCC um, reports. It involves uh, production of bioenergy um, to generate electricity and heat and capturing the carbon emissions. And again, carbon dioxide, con the concentrated carbon dioxide is injected into geological reservoirs. So uh, the idea is capturing carbon after vari various forms of bioenergy are burned and on paper, these are considered carbon neutral because carbon dioxide is released from bioenergy will be approximately equivalent to or offsetting the carbon dioxide absorbed by, by new uh, plant growth and it's hailed as carbon negative. This is the claim. And BEX is actually a, a primary carbon dioxide removal technology, a form of geoengineering or a negative emissions technology. But will it work? There are actually tons of studies that, that there is serious flaw on the idea of carbon neutrality and negative emissions, that at least a third of the injected concentrated carbon dioxide are actually immediately released back into the atmosphere. And a lot of CCS projects in coal plants, even small scale, have been unsuccessful in delivering carbon dioxide um, capture despite massive government um, um, subsidies. So the claims have actually been disproven and they have also um, studies that show that it could compete seriously with food production, would have devastating impacts on land, water, and biodiversity, would increase demand for fertilizers and agrochemicals, and would adversely impact farming and forest ecosystems, not to mention impacts on and control over ownership and competition for land and other productive resources. Um, the idea of the direct Air capture also um, operates in the same way, capturing, transport, and um, in CCUS, in carbon capture use and, um, use and um, storage, it actually involves um, using the carbon dioxide to produce some products, which actually studies have shown would also form, um, release um, carbon dioxide over time. The idea of carbon farming has also become very popular um, in the past um, few years, um, especially in the discussion on carbon, um, carbon credits. Um, this is actually um, carbon dioxide removal in agriculture, and not just agriculture, but also in vast oceans for agricultural land. Um, the idea is to profit from carbon offset, um, which requires transforming agriculture into a new carbon um, farming model. And many of the carbon farming ideas are actually also involving BEX, as I mentioned um, earlier. And um, this is actually um, disproven that because new science have actually shown that soil carbon sequestration um, um, is not actually um, um, standing on solid science, that's car that soil carbon storage capacity is actually overrated and they do not take into account high, high energy costs of the use of digital tools and the threat to peasant communities and livelihood. And um, as I mentioned, there's been a hype a lot about um, carbon farming. Um, you see this in main, mainstream publication, um, projecting that carbon is the crop of the future, and this is the new uh, the new crop that farmers will have to to profit from. And you have all the big big agricultural companies that are promoting um, carbon farming now um, under different names, such as regenerative agriculture. You have Bayer, you have Cargill, you have Pepsi, all announcing that they're part of the superpowers fight against climate change and through um, regenerative agriculture and carbon farming. So my last slide is, how do we tackle um, these false solutions? We need to expose the reality and actors behind the fad and the terms and the meta narratives such as nature-based solution, climate smart agriculture, regenerative agriculture. You have to unpack and name the solutions and technologies involved, like the education bit of the approach that um, Claire mentioned. You have to unmask the interests and actors behind, um, including how institutions like the UN are actually being used to promote false solutions. We have to interrogate the market interests behind them and tackle the dilemmas and promote real solutions that are rights-based, 
based on equity, climate justice, environmental sustainability, and people's participation, all the elements that actually comprise the foundations of Laudato Si. And lastly, we need to promote accessible, appropriate, and needs-based solutions and innovations that build on, develop, and advance generations of knowledge from diverse sources, including traditional and indigenous knowledge systems. So I end my presentation there. Thank you for the time. If you want to know more about geoengineering, uh, please um, take note of this um, information in my last slide. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ned, for that presentation. Uh, one of the things that uh, we often talk about is the idea of uh, false solutions in how we deal with climate change. We'll come to a more discussion on that uh, towards the end of this um, round one. Uh, right now, I'd like to introduce you to our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Gary Tessera, and he will be speaking on decarbonizing Malaysia, what's on the agenda. Gary is a consultant technical advisor to the Malaysian Green Technology and Climate Change Corporation, MGTC, and the council member of Climate Governance Malaysia. He serves on the board of the Center for Environment, Technology and Development Malaysia as a non-executive director and advises private sector and civil society organizations. Gary was previously Deputy Undersecretary for Climate Change at the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment and formulate, uh, formulated national environmental and climate change policy and negotiated on Malaysia's behalf at 14 UN climate conferences or COPs. Gary has a PhD in agronomy from Mississippi State University. Over to you, Dr. Gary. Thank you very much, Kennedy. It's a pleasure to be here and an honor. Thank you very much to the organizers for having me. Um, I'd like to, uh, first of all, uh, uh, make a clarification that I'm speaking as a council member of Climate Governance Malaysia. That's an organization uh, whose aim is to improve uh, the performance and role of the private sector in addressing climate change. Uh, yes, I used to be a civil servant, but I'm no longer uh, in the civil service, having retired several years ago. Right, so my role today is actually to localize this to the Malaysian context and give you some sense of how Malaysia is dealing uh, broadly with climate change, particularly in terms of how we might want to reduce emissions. The reason for that uh, is because it needs to be very clearly understood that our actions to address climate change fall into two fairly broad categories. The first category is adaptation. Climate has been changing, is continuing to change, will continue to change, and these changes are having impacts which we as a country, as a civilization, uh, will need to adjust to, whether it's saving more water for dry periods, whether it's, it's uh, harvesting uh, water to prevent floods, all of these things fall under the side of adaptation. What I'll be focusing on today is what you see on your right, mitigation, or more specifically actions or changes in society, et cetera, to reduce the uh, greenhouse gases that we uh, emit. Now, not just carbon dioxide, but the host of other greenhouse gases that we're responsible for, are not always from combustion to produce energy. Some come from chemical reactions, for example, production of cement. Some come from uh, refrigerants uh, in our air conditioning systems and the like. The other thing that we can do uh, to mitigate is actually to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Plants do this very naturally. Our natural forests do it. Uh, our plantations do it as well. But you must understand that the carbon removed by our plantations is then put into commodities like timber, like palm oil. And then as we use these commodities, we re-emit this carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Um, you can think about it uh, more broadly also, looking at the uh, actions that you could take to mitigate climate change. I've circled them here. We've got uh, energy conservation, often uh, uh, shortened to, to uh, EE energy efficiency, renewable energy, often shortened to RE. Yes, I know it's rife with acronyms. All right, we can uh, replace fossil fuels with other fuels. It's called fuel substitution. We can change the way we do things. Nobody is saying we, we can't be mobile, but we need to be mobile with low carbon. So whether it's electrification, whether it's public transport, whether we're using electrical two-wheelers, etc., uh, all of these things. Now, we can also um, 
to capture and try to remove greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. Uh, uh, Nath has already talked about, and Nina to some extent, about carbon capture. These are the technological things. But nature captures carbon naturally. Our forests uh, capture carbon and living forests, healthy forests, all kinds of forests, all the way from montane forests downhill to uh, the uh, mangrove forests all sequester carbon. Now you look here, you'll see that there's a significant overlap of mitigation with adaptation. I'll talk about some myths in a minute, but there are some mitigation actions that actually also deliver adaptation benefits. And of course, if we conduct these mitigation actions, then we will sort of kill two birds with one stone to use a very poor metaphor there. But the idea is we get uh, benefits of adaptation while at the same time having mitigation benefits. Now, there are some uh, uh, myths associated with mitigation. The first of these perhaps is that reducing energy consumption reduces greenhouse gas emissions. If I reach over and turn off the light switch here, that somehow it changes the amount of greenhouse gases that we emit. This is actually uh, 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 false. You can think about hour where for one hour rolling around the planet you know everyone turns off their lights or preferably if they're doing better all the electrical appliances for one hour now i can tell you for a fact that, that no coal uh, fired power plant shuts down for one hour all right it takes so much energy and so much time to bring these huge edifices into production that they do. In fact, Earth Hour is the time that all the emissions are actually not used. So we need to think about, about Earth Hour in a different sense. It's about building awareness. All right, reducing what reduces emissions is actually reducing the energy generation from fossil fuels. All right, so if you reduce, uh, if you produce energy from biomass or biogas, uh, from solar PV, from wind then you are reducing a greenhouse gas emissions. Second myth is that mitigation is gen revenue generating, which then, you know, there's lots of investment in mitigation actions, lots of investment uh, loans in this regard, but not adaptation measures. That's also not true. The smart tunnel is a Malaysian example of adaptation that generates revenue that has paid for itself and is actually profitable. So not just mitigation can generate revenue. Another myth that, that uh, is somewhat prevalent is that, and this was promulgated by developed countries as an excuse for why they want to finance mitigation but not finance adaptation. This myth has been largely broken by the Malaysian negotiators. Actually, both mitigation and adaptation have local as well as uh, international or, or uh, multiple benefits. And because of global supply chains, adaptation as well has global benefits. All right, so move on next to the idea of what Malaysia's emissions look like. Uh, try not to be intimidated by this uh, graph. It actually shows Malaysia's emissions from 1990 here on the left up to 2019, the time when we have uh, the most updated data. If we look at this graph, you'll see that it's actually centered on zero. And what is above the zero is releases, emissions of greenhouse gases, What's below the zero is sequestration, absorption of greenhouse gases. And if you take a look at it, the largest component of our emissions, which is a growing component still, there is a little bit of, of leveling off, is energy. So fossil fuels used to generate electricity, uh, used for mobility, drive us around, things like that. All of these uh, contribute to this yellow area. Also, um, a small, much smaller amount from industrial pro processes and product use. Uh, these are chemical reactions, for example, that release uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, for example, it would be uh, uh, any kind of, of release from refrigerants, for example. All right. Uh, now, third one is waste. This is an important one because Malaysians are known for generating lots of it, particularly organic waste. And organic waste in a landfill, decomposing anaerobically produces methane, which is a very potent greenhouse gas. One ton of methane has the impact of 25 tons of carbon dioxide. So anything that we can do to reduce this amount of methane, whether it's composting, uh, whether it, it's, it's dealing with, with uh, 
animal manure management, uh, improving the management of our, our livestock waste, all of these things will make a difference. Finally, this uh, guava, uh, pink guava colored uh, line close to the zero is, is agriculture. Over here, you will find emissions from livestock, you will find emissions from livestock waste and the like. On the opposite side, this big green mass is actually what our Malaysian forests sequester every single year. We have a pledge to keep at least 50% of our uh, land area uh, under forest. And the difference between what's above this zero line and what's below the zero line gives you the net emissions. So here we are, we've got, this is the red line. I like to, to, to point out these net emissions. So um, when we talk about offsets, what we have already is a naturally occurring offset. By growing and by sucking carbon out of the atmosphere every year, our forests already remove a certain amount of emissions from the atmosphere, giving us our net emissions down here. All right, so since there are no more emissions to be used for offsets from this pool of sequestration. Things need to be added to this pool, whether it's a form of microalgae farming, whatever it is, any kind of, of additional sequestration to be added to this pool to reduce this net number. So to uh, have good mitigation, we need to either reduce greenhouse gas emissions or we need to enhance carbon removal. We've talked a lot about hope. What gives me hope? If you look at this point here in 20, 2004, at this point, Malaysia was still actually net negative. In other words, our forests sequestered, prior to that, our forests sequestered more than our emissions. And since in, in 18 or 19 years since, what has driven the growth in emissions is investments and we can use the same mechanisms the same investments applied to green technologies applied to low carbon technologies that can change this malaysia has uh, a self-declared target under the un framework convention on climate change the paris agreement we have the nationally determined contribution or ndc you must be careful there are many versions out there on the web some are outdated the most recent one is that malaysia intends to reduce economy-wide emissions intensity of GDP by 45% uh, by 2030 compared to 2005 levels. It is all unconditional. Yes, we used to have some conditional uh, reductions, 35%, but now that is no longer the case. Uh, so we've gone entirely unconditional on the whole thing and we've expanded our scope from five gases to seven key greenhouse gases here. All right now, when we look at, at the current measures to, to uh, address climate change, to reduce emissions, it's very heartening to note that in the budget alone, we already see uh, several key areas, subsidizing, uh, hopefully improving uh, use of the public in public transport, giving these unlimited passes, extending the life of these unlimited passes, uh, first and last mile, trying to improve public bus accessibility. I've personally used the, the My50 uh, pass at my age. I'm actually looking forward to getting the, the, el <laughs> the, the elderly, a uh, great gray-haired citizen pass. All right. But I've also, uh, also used the MRT and I'm uh, quite uh, heartened to note that the MRT3 is something that is already on the cards. When it comes to low carbon energy, none of us can change the carbon footprint of the grid. The only thing we can do right now is maybe install uh, some solar panels on our own roofs and use less from the grid. But the grid uh, carbon footprint is fixed, although it is changing. The more and more large-scale solar we have on the grid, the, the greener it will be, but it's still fairly slow. In the budget, still some key things here. Green technology financing scheme extended. It's now part of a green sukuk. Uh, still for some allocations for environmentally friendly projects, including for reforestation. This is what I want to point out that's important here. Not just the big boys, the, the international companies, the public business companies, but also the SMEs. Some allocation for them to implement sustainable technologies. Finally, something that might be interesting to the Catholic Church and to other uh, houses of worship as well, the uh, program Rumah Ibadat Hijau. In this case, Rumah Ibadat that he's a book on Islam. So there's even an allocation to maintain, to upgrade uh, houses of worship or other faiths to make them uh, greener, consume less energy, etc. In the area of private transportation, yes, 
we do want to promote public transportation, but we do understand there are many areas still cannot be served, that cannot be served by public transportation. So we have an import duty exemption, an excise duty sales tax exemption on EVs, uh, components as well as completely knocked down models. This is until 2027. So it's still time to get out there and get that EV that you wanted. Now, for completely built up models, it's only until 2025. But we also have trying to promote the uh, industry here in Malaysia, uh, all kinds of, of greener vehicles, whether they're hydrogen, whether they're internal combustion hydrogen, uh, whether they're electric, whether they're hybrid. All right. So the manufacturing of, of charging facilities for EVs is also very, very important. Now, if you look at the budget, you will see that we actually do have an allocation for carbon capture and storage of CCS. We've mentioned by Mina and Neth already, but I think what makes a big difference are the details. What are you going to uh, use for energy from which you are going to capture that carbon? And how are you going to use the carbon? The use is important. Uh, for example, uh, there are, you, you can use the carbon for something uh, as simple as you know carbonating your drinks, which then when you, the moment you open the bottle, it's already back in the atmosphere. But you could also use that carbon dioxide to do things like feed microalgae. Microalgae require a pure source of, of, of uh, carbon dioxide. This can come from combustion of biofuels, biomass, for example. So when you're using biomass, you've taken that carbon out of the atmosphere. Then if you combust that biomass, particularly if you pyrolyze it, meaning you burn it in an oxygen-free environment, you actually produce something called biochar, which is very stable over tens to thousands of years, can be used as a soil additive. And then if you use the CO2 that evolves to feed algae and other things, then you can continue upcycling the carbon to much, much better uses. Uh, uh, if you see in detail the, the incentives for companies doing in-house as well as, as servicing the carbon uh, capture and storage. Thank you very much for the notification. Um, okay. Uh, all right. Um, the, the last thing I think is, is very, very important. There has been this so-called EFT, or Ecological Fiscal Transfer, uh, amount of, uh, of 150 million targeting uh, forest conservation, including the biodiversity and the the carbon, uh, sorry, and the, the species flora and fauna that they shelter. Waste management is very, very important. Like I said, uh, waste is a big part, particularly our organic waste. Uh, in my family, we have a, a machine that actually uh, composts food waste, including the meats. The, a lot of the, the, the vegetable matter actually goes to my outdoor compost. Uh, the, the amount of trash that the alum flora takes away is about the size of my windshield per week. All right, that's the amount of uh, emissions that we can actually reduce. Zero waste community development also a, a very big one. Now I'd like to to uh, talk a little bit about uh, uh, some of the, the 12th Malaysia plan. If you go and look in chapters eight and nine of the 12th Malaysia plan, you will see that, that what's in the budget actually is uh, an activation or a mobilization of things coming from the 12th Malaysia plan. This is very, very important because I think uh, with all the administrations we've had recently, it's been very hard to have policy. And I'll talk about that later in a little bit. All right, but these are the things that came out of the uh, 12th Malaysia plan. When you look at the policies, we have a great number all of these are our policies, but the important things that we are looking for still are some of these here uh, at the very bottom. I'd like to end with a very heartening slide. I think this is very, very important. Just a few days ago on the 9th of May, a number of very, very key uh, decisions taken by the ministry showing that they are listening to all the stakeholders whether it's stakeholders in the private sector, whether it's from civil society, whether it's from uh, uh, special interest groups, indigenous groups. So our renewable energy generation capacity target raised to 70%. A little bit confusing because this 70% is associated with 2050 and we're supposed to be net zero by 2050. But let's get the details on that. Uh, the previous ban on exporting renewable energy has been lifted. That's a wonderful thing because we can now use foreign currencies, which might be stronger than ours, who, uh, have a who have a demand for renewable energy. 
companies in Singapore, for example, that are RE100, want to label themselves 100% renewable energy, willing to buy renewable energy from Malaysia with Sing dollars, a great way to finance our transition. And then, you know, uh, buy, buy, willing buy, willing sell, a so-called peer-to-peer, so that all the unused capacity in the palm oil mills, for example, that generate their own electricity, can actually get on the market to a neighbor next door, can be sold, and so it's a huge uh, a win, I think, for the private sector for using renewable energy. Uh, finally, a uh, very, very big thing, the National Energy Transition Roadmap which I think will be much more powerful than simply a policy due out at the end of the month. All right. I believe that's all I have. Thank you very much. Look forward to receiving your questions later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gary. That was a very insightful look into uh, Malaysia's own roadmap uh, for climate action. Uh, there's a lot of things that we'd like to discuss about what you presented, which we'll bring up during the uh, Q&A. And now we've come to uh, topic four, which is decarbonizing Malaysia, the winners and the losers. I'd like to present our speaker, Mr. Anthony Tan. Uh, Anthony is the Director of Finance for the All-Party Parliamentary Group Malaysia on Sustainable Development Goals, APPGM SDG. You'll see this a lot in the media. He holds a master's degree in Sustainable Development Management from Sunway University. And Anthony has been involved in climate action since 2006. He styles himself as your friendly neighborhood environmentalist. Please welcome Mr. Anthony Tan. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon, good evening and good morning to everyone. Um, yeah, so decarbonizing Malaysia winners and losers. If uh, things are done right, there will only be winners for planet people and prosperity. We've had a better planet. We actually have a better planet to live in. Um, but I just like to to stop here and clarify something. Our we continuously refer to Laudato C, si, but we don't complete the sentence because it is actually Laudato C, si, mi señor, which means. Praise to you, my Lord, because Laudato Si alone means praise to you. And who do we praise? We actually praise the Lord. Here is a pessimistic view. What if things are done, done for all the wrong reasons? And you hear, you could hear some of that from the previous three speakers, but uh, I'm going to be slightly more of a prophet of doom and gloom. Number one, uh, the winners would be actually climate change negotiators because they will actually give a sense of false uh, hope in the sense that if decarbonizing is done in the, for the wrong reasons, uh, it would mean as if that they have already done their job that they've already achieved whatever uh, the reasons for the negotiations. And, and here is also another, another strange thing. We are actually working towards uh, saving the planet and we are negotiating for our lives. It is as if we were to negotiate. If we live, can we give up one of our arms or our legs? I don't think that's something that we want to do. Secondly, in Malaysia, the winner would be carbon exchange. There's already been talk of a carbon exchange being uh, opened by Bursa Malaysia, and it will actually deal uh, with uh, carbon certificates or carbon savings as if they were actual products or actual um, shares. So there is a business, business platform to trade emission reductions. Um, uh, in the Catholic Church, I think we, we used to think in terms of uh, paying for our sins. Uh, in, in terms of in the Middle Ages, they used to pay to the church so that sins are omitted for their relatives and friends uh, who are up in heaven. This is a new form of it and it is actually governed by the exchange. Early investors will definitely make money when, when uh, the decarbonizing Malaysia is done in a wrong way. Why? 
it's always a case of whoever invests early will make the most profits when the investment's uh, profitability comes into reality. So whoever invests early will get more profits. Early adopters of carbon credit schemes. Now, there could be a situation where there may be multiple carbon, carbon uh, credit schemes being done in Malaysia. Um, this has been seen in Europe, it's been seen in the US, uh, and uh, very often when one scheme collapses, another scheme comes, comes online and it takes over. So the early adopters, they can reap the profits of their investments in different schemes, uh, shifting from one scheme to another, and uh, they will cash out whenever the, the, the price is right. Carbon traders, um, I have nothing against uh, Forex traders or even uh, share traders. Uh, the thing is all traders make money whether the, the people who are trading lose or make. So the more transactions that are made, the more carbon traders make in terms of fees. So this is something that, that uh, we have to also keep in mind if decarbonizing Malaysia is done in the wrong way. Number six, market manipulators. Uh, carbon markets are not new. Uh, Malaysia has actually participated in something called the Clean Development Mechanism. Uh, for those of you who can quickly Google, it, actually the CDM came up as part of the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, and Malaysia, uh, if the conversation uh, in one of the uh, recent WhatsApp groups is to be followed, 150 projects were actually launched by Malaysian uh, companies to the uh, UN CDM committee. And most of these projects were, were actually originally um, valued at per ton between 30 to 50 US or euros. By the time those projects actually became mature, the actual price that they were getting were anything below 5 US dollars or 5 euros. So the problem that came up is overpromise, under deliver. So just as in normal stock markets, cover markets will be open to insider trading. People who may know that hmm, what's being reported today may not actually be the reality in the next two years or one year. I might as well go in push the stock price up, and then cash out. And finally, um, for those of us who are already in our uh, 50s and 60s, I'm 59, uh, and Gary, I've got another seven months to go before, five months to go before I get my senior citizen card. I'm 59 in October. Uh, the older generation for... Uh, I remember my, my own ex-boss, Mr. Gurumit Singh from, Engineer Gurumit Singh from Saddam, he said he's already 80. By the time 2050 comes, he may not be around. So for the older generation, the golden population, they will believe that they have done all that they can to preserve the environment. And going back uh, to what was said right at the beginning, we're talking about a 1.5 degree Celsius increase that we want to maintain anything above that we will not have anything to eat quite seriously eventually we will be looking at each other and we'll see who gets to eat who it's not a dog eat dog world it'll be a man eat man world we will not be around to see the destruction i i i i'm sad to say this i'm going to be 60 this year i don't know by 2050 i'll be around because by that time i'll be in my 70s, late 70s. Who are the losers? The loser, biggest loser is going to be the planet and the environment. Zero emissions do not mean that there are no more emissions in the atmosphere. That was shown very well by the uh, second speaker and the third speaker. The previous emissions are still in the atmosphere for decades and even hundreds of years. I think all three speakers have, have mentioned this. People, the rakyat, 
in Malaysia are going to be given a false sense of we have already done something to save the planet, but we have we actually done enough to save the planet. Here in Malaysia, we 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 actually produce. Uh, I I hope Gary will will correct me on this, but we produce probably less than one point six percent of carbon emissions in the whole world, but we still emit. And we still have to remember that if you look at the map of Asia, the lowest point of Europe and Asia is this place called uh, Tajung Piai in Johor. If the Chinese and the Europeans all rush down into Vietnam and into uh, Thailand, they will simply push us into the ocean, those in the peninsula. Those in Sabah Sarawak may survive longer. The government, as extreme weather conditions continue to spread with floods and droughts in Malaysia, the government will have to increase spending on emergency services. This is a given. You have more droughts, more fires. We have to invest into more fire engines and also uh, planes that carry water and fire retardant. More floods, more of our resources go into relocating people and having to uh, spend more money in giving aid to victims of floods. Sustainable development uh, and coming from the uh, APPJM SDG and even the acronym is actually quite long, it's a, it's a mouthful. With bigger expense of emergency services, the government of Malaysia will not have enough funding for sustainable development programs. As it is, we only spend about a quarter of our federal budget every year on development. If more and more goes towards emergency services, this may drop to even 20% or even 15%. SMEs will be big losers. Small and medium-sized enterprises are most severely affected by the strict requirements insisted by developed countries. Those are the Annex 1 countries that were mentioned very much earlier. Many local businesses will be negatively affected because they will not be able to, to meet the requirements unless they go into investing today. And six, late investors are always the ones that lose out. Uh, I was told this uh, before the first uh, financial crash in the 80s. It is said that when the uncles and aunties enter the stock market, it is time to cash out and leave. So when the late investors think that they can make money in the, uh, what do they call the, the, the carbon exchange, that's when folks, it's time to leave the room. And finally, the younger generation of Malaysia are going to be the biggest losers because those born in the third millennium are left holding the bill. They will actually be the ones who will be forced to take action on things that we have done. You know, uh, one, of the, one of the sad things that many of us who are in our 50s and 60s, our grandchildren will be asked by their grandchildren, what the hell did our great-great-grandfather think when they were burning fossil fuel all these years? The younger generation is going to suffer. The younger generation is going to pay the bill. We are saying the amount that we want to spend on mitigation and adaptation is too expensive for us. It will be out of reach for the younger generation of Malaysians. So, decarbonizing Malaysia. The reality is, folks, we are on the Titanic. Um, whoever wins the last uh, game of cards or the Titanic, we're all going to sink. So there's no point celebrating that, oh, we've done this, we've done, we've done that little thing, we've, we've cut down one ton here or 10 tons there. If the, if the hole at the hull of the tenet is so huge and the water pouring in is faster than the water pouring out, we're all going to drown. So if decarbonization is done wrongly, even having lifeboats will not save us because we're all still stuck on the same planet. So 32 Malaysians, million Malaysians, we have nowhere else to swim because everywhere else has gone underwater. 
So thank you very much for your patience. Uh, again, I'm the Director of Finance for the All-Party Parliamentary Group Malaysia on Sustainable Development Goals. I'm taking a breath, APPGM SDG. For those of you who would like to contact me, my email address is akhtan at gmail.com. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Anthony Tan. Uh, and with that, we've come to the uh, end of all the four presentations for round one, and we will now have a Q&A session. I'd like to start first by uh, just inviting everyone who has questions to put them in the chat room, uh, in the chat box, and we'll try to address them. If you are still here, I'll call out your name and you can ask your questions directly to any one of the panelists here today. So we'll just uh, take a look at some of the questions uh, that are here. And the first one is uh, from Gabby from the Philippines. Uh, she asked for an explanation as to how nature-based solutions are counted as false solutions. So I think uh, one Mina and then also Net uh, talked about it uh, quite extensively. So uh, open the questions to you. Then maybe I'll give it a go. I think I think we need to understand that um, nature by itself and many of the like you know when you talk about ecosystem based approaches, all that is very good. I think uh, you know you talk about mangrove regeneration. You're talking about conservation of forest and um, you know rehabilitating degraded forests. All that is fine. I think it becomes toxic when you talk about it in terms of international carbon trading and the concept of net zero. Because what, what it assumes is that, like, like I just want to clarify, because Gary also talked about Malaysia's sequestering, I mean, our balance of emissions versus the sinks. I think that's fine. That's an internal accounting system within a country where you look at the emissions, because you actually can look at your emissions and you look at your, um, what do you have, the sinks, and then you add the total of at the end of the day as to what your um, emissions are. So that's fine. But the problem begins when it comes to international trading of carbon, because what we are saying, and this is the issue of the offsets, what we're saying is because the carbon space left is very, very little, every country actually needs to go to reducing carbon, to decarbonize. It's not about maintaining your emissions, continuing to emit, and then you say, oh, I'm going to plant a tree in Kenya. Or, you know, you can't. There's no more room for that. So the point we're saying is offsets is really not the way. If that happened during the clean development mechanism under the Kyoto Protocol, when developing countries didn't have an obligation at that time. So, you know, the, the thought that, you know, developed countries can be assisted by developing countries doing the emissions reduction, that's gone. That time is no longer here. So you have to all decarbonize, and decarbonize means you have to reduce the emissions. So if we have to reduce the emissions and we have to increase the forest and, the, and, and nature, that's true. But the problem is when it is used, like I said, in the way in which new asset class um, companies saying, oh, I am going carbon neutral. And then you look at what they're doing. They're actually continuing expansion and production. And then they say we are planting trees in you know, Malaysia and we are offsetting. Now, that's the false thing that we're, looking, we're saying. So you have to see the context of it. So nature-based itself is not a problem, but it's the way in which it is abused and misused and being sold as a solution to our climate crisis. So I think, I hope I've made that clear. Thank you very much, Mina. There's an adjunct uh, to that question, which I'll address to Ned, and this is about uh, root causes. In your presentation, you talked about uh, all the various solutions available. And you, you pointed out that we're not addressing root causes. So we have the alphabet soup of, of uh, solutions, but uh, can you elaborate on root causes? Yeah, I think Claire also referred to this in her presentation, that the root causes of the climate crisis is the production and consumption processes that are dependent on the burning of fossil fuel. And that's what we are now. And none of these four solutions address the root, root cause. Carbon capture and storage will not stop anyone from burning fossil fuel. It will actually promise a safety latch that, okay, you keep on burning. I will capture that carbon anyway. And this is very clear. I'd like to cite this because um, you will see this more and more in the press releases of the current president for COP28, Sultan Al-Jabed, uh, who is an important man 
in the UAE and everywhere he goes, all of his statement is actually, we need carbon capture and storage if you are going to do a business approach, business mindset in addressing the climate crisis. He doesn't say that we stop stop uh, produ- um, building more, more um, um, coal-fired power plant or more fossil fuel um, infrastructures. He just says that we invest on that, their direct air capture. We invest on carbon capture and storage. So we actually address the emission issue, but doesn't address the, the, the cost of, of all these emissions. So that's what I meant by that. Um, I think, um, uh, as, as, as I mentioned, Claire elaborated on that, and I hope that that's clear. That's also very clear in all these geoengineering um, solutions, which is actually going to cool down the planet, okay, cool down the planet, and yet will not address the dependence of the world on fossil fuel. Same way with all this carbon dioxide removal, um, particularly the engineering um, uh, based um, carbon dioxide removals, which are actually being discussed now in Article 6.4, mechanisms of the Paris Agreement. This is what exactly uh, Mina is saying, that um, you have to look at all these meta narratives as connected. You know, when you talk of climate smart agriculture, nature-based solution, net zero, and put that together in a context of the UNFCCC that is so desperate about um, redirecting investment by the private sector into so-called um, sustainable um, direction and yet offering the, the, the market as, um, as a solution um, to that. So you have to really look at all these pieces together. Um, that's why they become very problematic um, um, strategically as Mina, as Mina explained. Thank you, uh, Nat. Uh, Dr. Gary, you've raised your hand to want to add to the conversation. Yes, thank you, Kennedy. Just to make two points. First of all, that humans and our technology emit greenhouse gases at a much, much faster rate than any kind of nature-based solution is able to absorb it. We need to understand that trees grow over uh, decades, centuries even. All right, and, and the oceans, even though they're the largest uh, absorber of CO2, even microbes, microalgae do uh, sequester only at a certain rate. That's the first point. The second point really is when you look at the uh, graph that I presented about Malaysia, the yellow part above primarily was emissions, and then the green part below was the removals of sequestration. If Malaysia already makes the claim that their net emissions is such and such, they've already in essence used a national offset, a national asset, our forests as an offset. And none of those credits could actually be liberated to be used overseas because then that would be double counting the uh, sequestration. Thanks, those two points, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gary. Uh, Just to let you know, we have another 50 minutes uh, left in our Q&A. So I'm going to ask uh, for the panelists to Try and be more concise. I know it's it's really challenging because it, it's really a, a big, complex issue. Uh, Dr. Gary, this next question is from Lao Chan of Malaysia, and I'm going to address it to you. Do we have sufficient RE to export? The short answer is uh, no, not right now, perhaps. But Malaysia is is truly uh, gifted in terms of RE. All right now. Uh, uh, in isolated cases, for example, Bakun Dam, we do have excess capacity there. That excess capacity can be sold to countries like Indonesia. But I think the, the biggest solution is how do we uh, use the demand for our e overseas, particularly in Singapore, to finance the development of RE in Malaysia. Uh, Development of RE requires an enabling environment. It's not just the manufacturers, but it's also the the suppliers. It's it's the people who are involved in things like like, uh, uh, after after sales and service. It's the things, uh, even even after even after disposal, it's, it's extended responsibility for manufacturers. You want to, to get them to take back the stuff to recycle it properly, and then we. So it's it's not something about you know make use discard, uh, add to to the waste burden that we have, but uh, an entire uh, ecosystem uh, that is built to support all kinds of RE, particularly the ones that Malaysia is blessed with. I, I don't want to take more time, but uh, do do email me if you want a longer longer answer. Thanks. 
Thank you, Dr. Gary. It's interesting that you use the term ecosystem uh, and, and uh, Mina and the others have pointed out about nature-based solutions. And there is actually a move uh, towards uh, using the term ecosystem-based solutions as opposed to nature-based solutions, because a lot of people believe that the idea of nature-based solutions uh, has been hijacked. And when we say ecosystem-based solutions, we are talking about not just the technologies and not just nature, but the people, especially the indigenous people and just regular citizens and how they are affected. So that's uh, something for us to keep in mind. I have a question here from uh, Sister Asuleta from the Philippines. Uh, she says, may I be enlightened more regarding geoengineering? Does it harm the environment or does it help the environment? Uh, this I actually uh, replied, replied briefly that if you are used to use the principles that are um, presented on in Laudato Si, like I think all of that, you will get an X <laughs> if you're talking about geoengineering. Um, it's definitely top down. It's northern uh, base. It's actually controlled by corporations and, and frankly, military interest. If you look deeply um, into this. Definitely, there's no equity. If you discuss that, it's going to be uh, it's going to be decided by a few, and those few powerful ones are the same ones who actually caused the problem, or coming from from um, countries that actually brought us into this um, situation. Uh, participation is not even a discussion in geoengineering. They're even problematizing how are you going to involve governments in the UN. Now, that's even the problem. Like, will the UN be? an appropriate or relevant uh, uh, forum to discuss who's going to be sacrificed when you do solar radiation management, because it's already a given. Not a single study showed that there's not going to be a sacrifice. So which country is going to volunteer to be sacrificed in terms of flooding, um, changes in hydrological uh, patterns in order to save the US and Europe? Yeah, that's going to be a discussion in the UN. And the UN is not fit for purpose. Um, definitely, there's going to be a, a, a massive ecological cost. So the issue is monetization. Whose ecosystem is, is more economical to save than the rest? And what kind of economics is that? Definitely anti to see. As I said, we would need a whole webinar um, to do that. Um, and, but, the, but that's a short answer. And I would be happy to be rebutted by anyone um, in this room on those counts. Thank you, Matt. Uh, I think it, it's quite easy to find which country is going to uh, sacrifice. You just offer uh, drilling rights in the South Pole uh, and North Pole, <laughs> and then everybody will volunteer. So I, I think that's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a carrot there that we can use. Uh, thank you for that answer. This next question is uh, addressed to Mina, but I, I would like to ask it to uh, Mr. Anthony Tan, uh, simply because of the role that APPM SDG plays. So the question is, uh, Please elaborate on why ESG is bogus. So, so remember, there was, there was an address to Mina first, yeah? So I'd like to get a perspective uh, from Mr. Anthony Tan because the APPM SDG, uh, I believe, uh, is trying to influence policy at the parliamentary level uh, for Malaysia. So the rest of the question uh, is, if, if ESG is bogus, then what solutions can businesses adopt? Because ESG is being... Uh, being accelerated now, we hear a lot about it. So, um, Mr. Anthony, and then maybe Mina can chime in as well. Thank you. Okay, um, I have been a proponent of GSE, not ESG, because governance comes before the social part. And when you get governance and social together, then the environment takes care of itself. Now, how do you ask a man who has no house to live in not to cut the tree and start a fire. It's impossible. So what we have is GSE, uh, sorry, ESG is very basically a tick box. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm going to piss off, sorry for using the word piss off in a Catholic environment, but uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to get many people upset with me because ESG has only been used as an investment tool. It makes companies look good. It makes companies look as if they are doing what is required to make this planet a better place to live in. But if you look at the ESG reports, you will find that it just so happens that they had something that they did and this they plug into planet. Something else they plug into uh, the uh, what they call governance. Something else 
they plunge into uh, uh, so social. Put it this way, if they are looking at giving everyone a good, fair salary, it's already part of our Employment Act. You don't have to wait for anything else to say, oh, I'm giving everybody a thousand five. Hello, everybody else is supposed to get a minimum of 1,005. So we have to look at it from a very, very clear perspective. ESG has to move beyond just a report that is required by Bursa. I mean, Mina, correct me if I'm wrong. You can actually get somebody to do an ESG report for you for 100,000 ringgit. Same template for 10 companies. Back to you. Thank, thank you, uh, Anthony. Uh, before I pass on to Nina, it, it's uh, quite interesting that you raised the issue of salaries. So one aspect of, of uh, climate is the climate justice area, and climate and human rights. And there's a thing called uh, BHR, or Business and Human Rights. And in one of the forums uh, for uh, scoping uh, how we move forward in human rights in Malaysia, a question was asked about how uh, we, uh, we treat people, you know, and I was, I was quite surprised. It came from a corporation and I was quite surprised. I think, uh, Dr. Gary, you were, you were at that forum as well. Uh, and the question was asked like, oh, you know, what standard should I follow or what framework should I follow uh, and things like that. And my, my answer to that was, uh, what would Jesus do? You know, as a, as a simple way of looking at it, if, if you are the CEO of a big company and, you know, you have safe, for example, palm oil, then you want to make sure that your workers have access to the same healthcare, the same uh, benefits, the same time off with their families, uh, the, the same salary, the same physical protections because they work in obvious conditions. So the answer is actually quite easy. It's just to, to look at yourself and, and take on the uh, adage about treating others as how you would be treated. So companies or corporations, I notice, tend to run into frameworks uh, and run into standards and things like that. In my take, uh, ESG represents not a way forward. It represents our failure to even do the basic things that, that you mentioned, Anthony, which is the laws are there for protecting workers. Uh, the ISO standards have been around for a long time, and they actually address how businesses should operate uh, in terms of emissions, pollution, uh, workers' rights, safety, and things like that. But we seem to want to obfuscate the situation uh, adopt another uh, jargon uh, so we can hide uh, from doing what really needs to be done. Uh, Mina, would you add to that? Yeah, no, all of this is voluntary. I think that's our problem. The notion itself, I mean, if you want corporations or to be more environmental, more socially conscious, more, you know, and don't just, and better in governance and don't just look at profits, but actually look at what they call value-based um, you know, there's a big, the big, big movement now to look at not just your your bottom lines, but I, is a country is a com company actually um, genuinely concerned and reinvesting in social values and environment and and in better governance and all that and you know so so it's like your corporate social responsibility right meaning that you know you can go and do all the destruction you want and then I do my corporate social responsibility by planting a few trees. Is this happening here in Penang, you know, the Penang South Island Reclamation Project? Perfect, classical, classic case of, yes. of greenwashing of the highest order. Um, Net, you and the, those of you who are foreigners may not know, that's a huge battle, um, you know, huge reclamation. Right now, the Penang state government is talking about 2,300 acres. There's like 2,300 football fields in an environmentally sensitive prime fishery grounds. And then they going to dump earth in there and, and, and you're going to destroy the fish resources and then they say oh our we have an e ecology offset program we are planting trees with fishermen somewhere there we are offsetting and then the design now Gary and JTC went and gave a design award on the island saying that it's very you know environmental and total bullshit and greenwashing of the highest <laughs> order I mean sorry sorry did I this is the I uh, uh, apologize. I mean, I, I beg my forgiveness from all of you. When we, when we <laughs> close, we'll, we'll ask Bishop to uh, pray for us. So, so yeah, I mean, the point is that it allows anybody and everybody to claim that they are very environmental, even Shell, you know, ExxonMobil, 
uh, be beyond BP and all of the ESG and Black Rock. I mean, come on, you know. I mean, so this is as we say, it's a lot of nonsense. But we do need to have regulations and laws, and we can't uh, expect the you know as as they say that the devils to you know come and say that we are have now become very conscious and the devil is going to change the world. Look, to be an angel, impossible. Thank you, Mina. Dr. Gary, you put your hand up, but I'm just going to pause for just a second. Very, very quickly, uh, you know, we've got the northern states already suffering from a water crisis, and they're having to do things like cloud seed. Do you know the carbon footprint of cloud seeding, not to mention the, the actually financial cost. But uh, Penang can no longer rely on, on mainland water uh, for, for, for an additional population of, of people and for the industry as well. Uh, it's very short-sighted, in, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gary. It's interesting that you pointed that, that out because I work primarily in water conservation. And one of the things we talk about is that we, we are blessed with a lot of rainfall, with a lot of uh, clean water, but uh, we will start to see uh, water conflicts happening. And this is a climate conflict. We've already seen the argument between the Kadar State government and the Penang State government about uh, who has rights to the water. And this is a pretty small area. If you compare what's happening with the other river systems like Nile, the Murray Darling in Australia, uh, and also uh, the, the rivers coming out of the Himalayas. And if one of the countries uh, block the water flow, water supply, then we're going to have really serious problems. But this brings me to our, our final question or discussion. And this is going to be an interesting one because uh, the, the question is from Magdalene Chiang from Malaysia. And the question is, Mina and Neth is saying uh, CCS and net zero is false. But Dr. Gary is explaining in detail, uh, which makes sense to her. So uh, I'd like to invite uh, the three of you, as well as Mr. Anthony, to, to talk about how the Malaysian government uh, and Malaysians generally uh, is positioning our response to climate change and uh, our climate actions. So who would like to go first? I'll nominate I'll Gary. First. No. Yes, can we ask Gary to go first? Okay, uh, Gary? I, I want to go first because oh, okay. I'm, not, I'm non Malaysian. Uh, so I'm okay. actually leaving it to the three of you. That's what I wanted to say. Okay, please go ahead, Matt. That's what I said. I'm leaving it to the three of you. Oh, That's a non okay. okay. So then we'll start with uh, uh, Dr. Gary because you explained a lot about Malaysian yeah. government's. Uh, actions yeah. and you have insight uh, being a former civil servant. I, th I think I think uh, uh, that that globally we have to put our finger on on the pulse of uh, global uh, uh, supply chains as, as well and global value chains as well. But since my retirement, I've been working uh, a bit more with the private sector, and we've seen uh, as, as as Mina very well knows unilateral measures, including uh, the the EU. Uh, um, uh, so-called red the renewable energy directive you know capping our our exports of of uh, biodiesel from from methyl ester things like that but now they even have uh, uh, legislation on european importers and any uh, commodity that they import now has to be certified to be free not only of illegal deforestation but free from legal deforestation as well so the private sector is really gearing itself up for changes in markets that will make malaysian products and services less competitive overseas if business in malaysia does not take measures and so the business community has been also engaging with the government to try to move some of these uh, needles in the direction of, for example, higher energy efficiency, for example, using the rooftops for solar, you know, that, 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 that land is too precious to plonk solar panels on. Uh, but rooftops, in any case, when you put a, a solar panel rooftop, you actually cool the roof for the people. So it's just like a double plus. And these are the kinds of things right? when we establish new areas of mangroves. We also, uh, besides sequestering carbon, we add nurseries for biodiversity we also have better coastal erosion protection protection from from severe storms all these things multiple benefits so when we look at esg and nature-based solutions from that perspective all right and do not do not let these terms get hijacked by 
uh, by that that part of business that that is is fond of creating value out of nothing, creating this very abstract value. Things that, for example, when you create an emissions allowance, all right, it's worth. I mean, it, it was worth nothing. You're not talking about anything. I'm just saying, okay, you as a company allowed to emit one time. Now that is suddenly worth money. All right. So get away from those abstract ideas, but get down to actually the science of nature. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mina, would you care to give your perspective? No, I, think, I think I answered that question already earlier. Uh, and what I was saying was that the issue really is of carbon trading and carbon offsetting in the international. There's no room for, for that kind of offsetting anymore. I mean, nature has a role, but as Gary has explained, um, CO2 emissions is not so easy to be sequestered. Uh, you know, you can't just chunk, plonk CO2, uh, you know, emissions and say, oh, the tree is, as we plant a tree today and it's going to take that one, that one ton of carbon. Impossible. It takes a long time for the tree to go, to grow. So this notion of one ton plus minus one ton equals zero, so this is our problem. So this is why we say that look at it in the larger context of, uh, of how some of these terms are being used or approaches are being used to actually do the real emission reductions that need to happen. That means you develop countries that can no longer go on this fossil fuel dependence. Now, come COP28, they are all going to talk about decarbonizing fossil fuel uh, you know, um, uh, face out, fossil fuel face out, load of hypocrisy. Because all that fossil fuel for and then they say abatement. And what is that abatement? Carbon capture, you know, and this, that, and the other. So a lot of it is a lot of, of hypocrisy. They should have gone to negative zero, negative, not even the real zero, negative emissions a long time ago so that the developing world would have had more carbon space to actually make the transition happen. So I think we need to look at it in, in all that many facets. Thank you, Mina. I'll tell you, raise your hand. Yeah, for the last comment, I think, Ken, because we've heard a lot about the false solutions. I think maybe to give people a little bit of hope, if they could give one or two examples of some truer solutions, for instance, there have been many reports on the role like Neth has put in the chat as well by indigenous peoples and so on. Um, these solutions do exist. So perhaps if anyone could just sort of focus on one or two, that will sort of like point people in the right direction about true solutions, because uh, it's very clear now what, what is false. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Can, can I intervene? Uh, yes, please, uh, Anthony. And Thank we're, we're going to come um, to the end of our, our session. So after this, I'll be asking each of the, the speakers to leave the audience with one takeaway as our summary, because we're short of time. So please proceed, Anthony. Right. Um, in, in Sabah and Sarawak, there is a uh, NGO called Tony Bung. It is led by the former Senator Adrian Lasimba. He has been uh, putting in micro, micro uh, solar and also micro, uh, micro hydro, hydro and even, yeah. and even uh, hybrid systems in areas where, where nobody wants to go. And uh, people actually pay for the electricity and the upkeep of their systems. And that's something which is really great. Uh, the, the other thing is, uh, I just went to a public university and they're talking about how do we do energy efficiency? And their electricity bill a month is one million ringgit for one faculty. So you, you imagine, Gary, you're right. We do Earth Hour every year. We make ourselves feel happy that we have saved uh, one, uh, what do you call uh, the electricity at uh, KLCC, but people drive from Shah Alam to KLCC, emit carbon, carbon emissions from their petrol to see a dark tower. Totally doesn't make sense. And they do it every year as a homage. So we, we've got to move away from that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gary, one takeaway for our, uh, our audience today. Yes, information is, is all out there, really. You you know your carbon footprint, you know where it's coming from, you know how much you drive, you know how far away you live from church, for example, you know if that distance is walkable or bikeable, all right? Uh, the late uh, uh, David McKay uh, was, was once said, you know, he was told every little bit helps. 
But he responded, if everyone does a little bit, then only a little bit will be done. What we need to do is everyone needs to do everything that they can. And this mm -hmm. is uh, this is a value that will change as the country changes, as, as new avenues become possible, then you can uh, change everything that you will do. And if everyone does everything they can, then I think that, that we have cause uh, to, we actually have a way of minimizing the, the human suffering and misery. The planet is actually not in any peril. It's, it's, it's survived a smack so big that it created the moon. All right, the planet is not in trouble. All right, we are the ones who are in trouble. And if we wish to survive as a civilization and as a species, then I believe that, that by doing everything we can, we can come closer to that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Gary. Uh, Nat? Yeah, thanks for that inspiring message, Gary. I also like to, um, to emphasize what we can. It's correct to, to name the current situation as an emergency, as a climate crisis, a climate emergency, but it should not bring us down to desperation that we actually are going to disempower ourselves by surrendering our power to the few powerful who have caused the problem. I think on the other hand, um, the emergency situation should actually embolden us to do what we can, as um, Gary has um, explained. That, um, that a lot of the things that could actually change the, the direction is actually in our hands. Like not just about um, power efficiency, but really um, doing our bit in, in every part of our lives in terms of being critical of the whole root causes, that the whole discussion um, that has brought us into this, this problem. So like really reframing the way we consume, the way we produce, um, at the local level and really emphasizing the importance of local to global and not undermining adaptation at all, but really seeing this as part of the, as the only way um, to solve the, the, the emergency, the crisis. I, I would really want to hammer on that, on that message. Thank you very much, uh, Nat and Mina. Um, yeah, just to, just to compliment what everyone is saying, although it has, has a bleak and and uh, gruesome it sounds. It's very, we all realize that it's a difficult task, but I think once your eyes are open and your heart is open, there's no stopping. Um, I think that song that was played in the beginning was really beautiful. And I think, um, and, and the fact that, it actually for me, for a lot of us, when we ask ourselves why we do what we do, and especially for the faith-based communities, if you see this as part of the course, I mean, I was brought up in a convent school so I used to love going and listening to, to all these catechism classes and I used to attend, but I'm still a Hindu, but it doesn't matter. But the point is that, you know, uh, the whole notion of, if I ask, I've asked myself, what motivates me? I think a lot of it goes to what we are, what, what, why we are in this world to do what we have to do. So if we are either part of the problem or part of the solution, and once our eyes are open and like today, there's a lot more information out there. We need to get it more and more educated, agree. We need to get more capacitated and we need to agitate for change. It's a political battle. Our elections are coming for some of the states. Our politicians are still in sleeping. Many of them are doing business as usual. We need to wake up. We need to, you know, take our pots and pans. We have to demonstrate, we have to agitate, we have to call for change. And we have to live the change we, have, we espouse for. So many things we can do. So for me, it gives me hope that um, in community, this is really something that's so exciting. There's a reason to live. There's a reason to fight. There's a reason to struggle. And most importantly, we have to give our, I mean, no matter what it is, we are doing this for the current and the future generations. So that gives me a lot of hope. Thank you very much, uh, Nina, for that. Very hopeful words. And uh, I'm going to end uh, today's round one session. Uh, by pointing out something that you said, which is the first step uh, in, in taking climate actions to be informed. Uh, and towards that end, we'd like to thank the Episcopal Commission for Creation Justice of Malaysia, Singapore and Brunei for hosting this webinar, Decarbonization and Ecological Approach. I'd like to thank all our esteemed speakers, uh, Ms. Mina, uh, Ned, Dr. Gary and Anthony uh, for uh, hosting us. And uh, I'm going to now um, say, actually, I have to say this. Uh, this is a reason for the commission to host more of these uh, webinars 
because a lot of the matters need a lot more time to unpack. There, there are quite a number of questions there where people are trying to, to understand uh, from a layman's term uh, how this should be approached so that they themselves can be informed enough to take action. So Claire, keep that in mind. Uh, and with that, we'd like to thank everyone who has joined this, uh, this session, round one. We'll see you again in round two. And I would like to invite the moderator for round two, Dr. Margaret Chiang, uh, to take over. Dr. Margaret, uh, are you here and ready? Thank you, Kennedy. Uh, in fact, I, I am uh, Margaret Chan. Uh, so I trust this section this session will cool us all down after the first round heated session, especially in the Q&A. Uh, as, we, as we are moving to round two, we have the faith-based organization who will be sharing with us on uh, the mitigation of uh, what uh, the what we have discussed over how we address this uh, uh, climatic crisis. We have four speakers from up north, United Kingdom, going down south to India, Malaysia, and Indonesia, who, who are so willing to share their initiatives and the mitigation and actions from their own country to address the cry of the earth and creation ecological justice. So without further ado, we will go to Indonesia first, from where our first speaker, Ms. Henning Paleng, comes from on her topic, Religions of the World Unite for Climatic Justice. I hope, Kennedy, can you um, come off from the shanks? And, and uh, we have uh, and, uh, uh, Henning, can you share your screen? while I introduce you. Now, Henning is the coordinator for Green Faith Indonesia. As a member of the Green Faith International, a global multi-faith movement to resist the planet's destruction and to create a sustainable, just future. Henning, can you share your screen? Can you share your slide? Okay, thank you. She is also an active member at the Climate Reality Project Indonesia and currently also the Vice Chairman of Environment and Disaster Management Institution of ISISA and Environmental Institution of Muhammadiyah. Uh, Henning, can you share the first slide of your profile? Oh, I think it's in your second slide. Okay, thank you. Now, Henning has a bachelor degree in sociology and a master degree in disaster management and 20 years of experience in humanitarian and environmental work. So let's welcome Henning and over to you, Henning. Yes, thank you very much, um, moderator. Thank you very much, uh, Margaret Chan. Um, I'm Henning, I'm from Green Faith Indonesia, so I will uh, presentation at the first about the Green Faith. As I hear before, there's uh, many problems, but also uh, we need action from many uh, actors and multi faith is one of the important that we have in the world to action together. So uh, here is a Green Faith. Green Faith is an uh, in international organization from multi faith and we have in the seven countries now green feet established in 1992 uh, originally a partner for environment quality green feet mission is to build a worldwide multi faith climate and environment movement and invasion to build resilient caring communities and economic to meet everyone's need and protect the planet. Greenfit is focused its work to conducting campaign and building capacities of interfaith organization. And its network members is connect to energy and climate justice. So we are more focused on climate and energy justice. There are 14 funding partners in the Greenfit International Network. And we committed to take number one is immediately to new fossil fuel project and deforestation. 
Number two is rapid transition to 100% renewable energy and fair phase out of fossil fuels and the commitment to adjust this transition to impacted workers and climate vulnerability communities. Our action in climate is ICOP, that is in Africa, uh, France, and also America. That is the public action, talk March in Uganda with the theme of responding to climate, and Tanzania with the theme uh, on planet over, plan over profit, we then has a part of it, this a global multi fit month and climate action. In March, commanded that oil, uh, I, I, I cop oil pipeline and really fit communities in demanding in immediately and of the I cop. Also, uh, we uh, have stop coal financing that is green fit US conduct command and advocacy to stop the coal financing protest and well done against bank in US that supported the coal financing such as Citibank, in well Fargo, Bank of America and others. So that this is very combiner in the some of the meeting international meeting in many banks. In Indonesia, stop coal greenfield Indonesia advocates the stop coal financing talk its campaign and joint action such as uh, joint activities with Greenfit Japan, talk meeting discussion with Japan Parliament, youth and religion leaders in Japan to financial contribution for Indonesia coal marketing. Others activities also included advocacy on energy transition to campaign uh, in coal energy power plant areas in Indonesia. That is, we have many good practices from Greenfit Network. In Greenfit Africa, the example of multi-stakeholder campaign to keep fossil fuel in the ground, advocacy in COP27, student movement on climate change, uh, public awareness and advocacy on energy and climate issues. In Greenfit Japan, uh, we have campaign of peace with art movement. So a joint petition a campaign with World Council of Churches, Laudo, Laudato Si Movement, the Islamic Society of North America, Green Angelican, and Fossil Fuel non Federation Treaty, and also others organization. Develop a short video entitled a Harmony Between People and the Planet for Coal and Energy Advocacy. Indonesia, uh, we have fight for climate justice. We have action in 272 action at the around of Indonesia, that in Java, Madura, Sumatra, Sulawesi, Kalimantan, Maluku, Papua, and Nusa Tenggara Timur. Uh, the climate for action uh, in for various community from women, student, youth, religious leaders, and others grassroots communities who are care about the future and clean energy in Indonesia. And there are all by from the multi faith in Indonesia. So many multi faith it is joined in this action. And the data compiled by Greenfit Indonesia that the fight for climate action is total more 5,121 volunteers. And we involve around 300.5 activities from the 25 provinces in Indonesia and 70 cities or district. So we also have the capacity building. Um, Greenfield Indonesia provide education to religious youth and women group, and also as leaders of faith about the threats to Indonesia future and the health its population from the climate change and air population, air pollution. Training we conducted in the three location, three provinces that most impacted and big from the coal area in Indonesia. Uh, we have a training, multi faith grassroots, grassroots movement for climate change, climate justice, 
multi-faith approach for energy justice transition and building multi-faith grassroots movement in uh, for climate justice. The aim uh, we also uh, building fatwa uh, not finished now and still on progress. The fatwa is Islamic law jurisprudence. The aim of the fatwa in Indonesia is to provide guidelines for Islamic-based organization for mainstreaming climate adaptation and clean energy program. Number one, uh, we consolidate a meeting of Islamic-based organization on climate adaptation and clean energy, a workshop uh, about the developing fatwa on mainstreaming climate adaptation and clean energy program, and also public expose and learn a seminar on Islamic policy and program on climate adaptation and clean energy. Also, uh, we have interfaith energy a transition book that is compiled by six uh, faith based in Indonesia, Islam, Christian, Catholic, Hindu, Buddha, and Konghucu. So uh, Greenfield Indonesia is partnership with the Islamic based organization Muhammadiyah and others religious develop the name is guide of place of prayers in Indonesia to adopt renewable energy. Uh, in the same worship in Indonesia, renewable energy is applied into the infrastructure design and worship places. The compilation and practices are documented and uh, be adopted to other worship uh, places across in Indonesia. Lesson learned is our uh, talk, joint action and collaboration uh, encourage a peace building process and develop joint understanding interreligious group. Uh, prof number two is provide acknowledgement and recognition of religious leaders' role in climate justice by encouraging and supporting its religious group members and how to take the action. In Indonesia, majority of people uh, said that they have a religion that is more than uh, mostly maybe 100% people in Indonesia have a, a faith. So number three is strengthen the role of youth and women group. It's very important here in the faith-based organization and make more impact in the communities and the movement. Also uh, advocacy to government pays more attention to religious group. And somehow uh, the government that we have advocacy, they more have trust to leader of religious than others. So why we put about the advocacy in here. And also we providing a wider access uh, to the communities to build their awareness and local action on climate change adaptation, talk worship and local network of fight based organization because it's very big uh, and many uh, provinces in Indonesia. The series of the activities during Faithful Action include peaceful demonstration in front of houses of worship, most churches, and theatrical action by youth group in the public space, organizing training, eco camps, campaign via podcast, and also planting a thousand of trees. At the last, encouraging all religious leaders to take an important role by holding movement based on their respective faith and reflected in country activities to protect and preserve the environment and encourage all their followers not to destroy the environment as urgency for the future generation. At the last, uh, moving forward is uh, number one, how to strengthen the role of faith-based organization and climate justice, job financial mechanisms, mechanism support, grant mechanism, also government collaboration and partnership scheme. Number two is compiling practices from multi-faith multi that can be used uh, as evidence-based to be cascaded to others' community adapted to the other countries and showcased to wider societies. At the last, 
to develop interreligious action strategy on climate justice to ensure stronger action and make more impact in collaborative partnership through multi-faith approach. Thank you so much. Assalamualaikum. Thank you, Henin. Uh, just before we leave, just just before that, we will leave the Q and A and summary at the end of this session. But if you have any question, uh, please don't forget to post your question in the chat group. So we'll move on to the next speaker, who is from the United Kingdom, and Edward Dickey will be sharing decarbonization dioceses in the United Kingdom. Now, Edward is the Integral Ecology Project Officer from the Laudato Sea Research Institute at Campion Hall, University of Oxford, working to facilitate implementation of the integral ecology paradigm within ecclesial communities of England and Wales, particularly the Roman Catholic Church and the Jesuits in Britain. He is a co-lead on the Guardians of Creation Project in particular, in partnership with Salford Diocese and St. Mary's University, Twickenham. This work looks to help Catholic Diocese decarbonize effectively in a way that is consistent with the Catholic social teaching. So let's welcome a word as we join in his uh, talk on the United Kingdom. Uh, a word, please. Wonderful. Good morning, everybody. Well, good morning in England, at least. Um, so I am going to talk to you a little bit about the context in the United Kingdom. Um, I hope this will be useful. Obviously, uh, decarbonisation is quite context specific, but I'm going to just tell you uh, how we've approached it in, in the Diocese of, of England and Wales, um, at least in some of the challenges we faced. So. The first thing really is um, we've got uh, our, our Bishop John Arnold is the, the Bishop of um, Salford, which is uh, in Manchester. Uh, Manchester, obviously, the uh, the heart of the Industrial Revolution. And uh, uh, whilst that's caused some, some good things for humanity, um, it's also caused a lot of um, problems, um, which we've been talking about today. And uh, this was just a, a part of an address made recently uh, Bishop John was part of a uh, interfaith and civil leaders uh, audience in Rome about two weeks ago, uh, where they presented a, an interfaith pledge to um, care for creation, to use uh, land owned uh, by faiths and civil society uh, to restore nature, um, and to generally, you know, tackle the climate crisis. Um, so we've we've got good leadership uh, in England and Wales um, under Bishop John. So in, uh, in our context, this is just a progression of, of the ideas that have happened over the last uh, seven or so years. Obviously, La Dati was released and uh, uh, caused a lot of uh, enthusiasm. Um, the, the Bishop's Conference then um, had appointed Bishop John as the spokesperson for the environment for the conference, um, and he put together a, a, a leadership group on that. Uh, we then started discussing, you know, what does net zero uh, mean for, for a Catholic diocese? Can we just use industry standards or should we start thinking about uh, how this is specific for us? Um, in, in Oxford, the Laudatasi Research Institute began to look at some of the more uh, academic questions ar around this. Um, and in Salford Diocese, uh, Bishop John uh, approved the start of a project we called Guardians of Creation, which was really looking at this technical aspects of decarbonisation for Catholic diocese. And that was uh, between his diocese, Salford, uh, between a, a, a university uh, near London called St. Mary's University, and also uh, the La Dati Research Institute where, where I'm based. Um, at the same time, Bishop John uh, turned his residence uh, into a ecological um, education centre, really, which is, has developed as the La Dati Sea Centre. Um, and it's quite an exciting place. Um, then all, all of the guidance was released. Um, at the same time, Salford Diocese released its own diocesan strategy. 
And more recently, the bishops of England and Wales have asked dioceses to start reporting on their carbon uh, accounting. Um, that's very early days, but I'll go into all of these in a little bit more detail. Um, but I think the most important thing that that Bishop John has been able to do is show that he's uh, he's enacting what he's asking his uh, brother bishops and dioceses to do. So locally, he's he's uh, he's turned where he lives into the Laudato Sea Centre. Um, but nationally, he's also uh, been, you know, putting together a, a group of people who have been doing more national guidance, so that everybody um, has the same guidance to be to be working off. Um, so I think that I think that's very important. He's not just asking people to do things that uh, he's not willing to to do in his own diocese. Now I keep talking about England and Wales. Uh, Scotland and Ireland are part of the United Kingdom, but they have their own bishops' conferences. Um, so the Bishops' Conference of England and Wales, there are 22 dioceses. Um, it's quite common for there to be about a thousand buildings in each diocese which are under diocesan control. Uh, and when we did some uh, not particularly detailed calculation for this, but uh, we think there's at least a million tonnes of carbon dioxide emitted every year from uh, the United Kingdom Catholic Church, if we add up the contributions from, uh, from all the dioceses. So there's a lot of carbon, we have a lot of buildings, we have a lot of responsibility. Um, and so that's what the Guardians of Creation project was about. And it takes the form of quite a big partnership of different parts of uh, the church in the United Kingdom. So when I, when I say we've done something, that usually means uh, a different a different body or a, a collaboration of people have, have done something and um, I think it's quite important to say that each diocese in the UK is you know more or less run uh, independently there's the bishops conference which has some overarching guidance but really decisions around things like carbon targets etc are uh, the individual diocese's decisions so Having overarching guidance is, is really useful, but the, the ultimate decision is, is local. Um, so yes, this is just a, a, a range of the different partners uh, involved in this process. Another important thing, uh, Bishop John was very keen early on that each diocese has somebody who is uh, leading this charge, who's in charge of ecological transition um, for their diocese. And uh, we do now have uh, I think all but nearly all dioceses have have this person in place. Um, only four or five have somebody who's paid to do that. Uh, only two have a full time paid position. I think um, the rest of them are either employed in other diocesan roles already uh, or are volunteers. So um, they have a limited capacity, but they um, you know, they do a good job with what time they have. The other, uh, the other important thing, and this has been going on for, for much longer than seven years, I think this has been developed over about 20 years, but the majority of parishes uh, within dioceses buy from the same energy provider. So the, the church in England and Wales has something called interdiocesan fuel management, um, which means everybody can buy from the same contract, which is green certified, um, and uh, you know, get a lower price for that. So, obviously, there's a, a lot of technicalities which were pointed out earlier about you know, is, is your green contract green? And there is some certification involved in this. But um, the force of that many buildings buying from the same contracts does help push the market uh, in the right direction. And the same with our gas contract, uh, which the bishops are quite. Um, quite a pleased uh, proportion of that comes from a gin dis distillery in Scotland from um, the gas derived from that distillery. So um, there's some interesting work going on on energy. As I said, a lot of this work has got to be voluntary because the budget isn't, isn't there in many cases. Uh, so there was a need to start developing enthusiasm for this in dioceses and to help resource them where they're struggling for uh, the budget and the, and the hours and the people to do this so by giving them a bit of a common framework it's helped um develop action in, in particular dioceses so there are i suppose 
three the, uh, the, the the documents in dark green are the ones which we've produced as part of the Guardians of Creation project uh, uh, internally, and then the the other three are uh, associated. Um, and I guess there's three main parts. There's a, a strategy document which uh, talks about how do you go about thinking about decarbonizing your your properties within a diocesan context. Uh, we've got a guide specifically on carbon accounting for Catholic dioceses. Um, uh, there's a, a suite of resources around embedding this in the schools. And also we did a paper on uh, understanding how Catholic parishioners respond to the ecological crisis. And uh, it, in a nutshell, it's everybody wants change, but they want somebody else to do it, which is um, a difficulty. Um, uh, and there's a theological underpinnings and some, some practical guidance on decarbonizing places of worship. I've taken all the parish, uh, all the uh, all the building names out of this, but one of the things this lets us do is prioritise uh, the buildings um, in terms of how much carbon they emit. So this is this is actually a a picture uh, of the Jesuits' buildings in the UK, where each box indicates how much carbon that building is is emitting. So doing the carbon accounting does let us say, oh my goodness, that building is using huge amounts more energy than anybody else. We should really be focusing our attention there. So um, doing this carbon accounting does help uh, quite a lot. And all these documents really have been focused on the diocesan management level um, because they have uh, a lot of responsibility for the, for the properties, obviously. And so we, this is just a list of people that we've made sure we, we're talking to as we uh, develop guidance and, and give um, give advice. We, we're just making sure we're involving all of the different groups of people involved in diocesan management so that it's it's useful to them. Um, so quickly, some of the responses. Um, bearing in mind what's been said about net zero, uh, I'll I'll touch on that just briefly. But so far, we've had seven dioceses which have set targets uh, for carbon reduction. Um, and seven out of twenty-two is not not bad going, and fourteen have set distinct environmental policies as well, uh, outlining um, you know, how they're going to go about dealing with the climate crisis uh, locally. And you know, it's all, that ranges from a one policy statement to some very, very detailed working. What I think is really important just to, uh, to, to touch on here is how we're reporting on, on carbon and how uh, what these net zero targets or carbon neutral targets mean. Um, and it's incredibly important we're stressing to be clear about what are you counting and what are you not counting so that we can fairly compare. And it was uh, touched on earlier that uh, there are three scopes of energy. Scope one is, you know, what's burned on site. Scope two is more or less what you, you buy in terms of energy. And scope three is everything else. Most of the emissions are usually in the everything else, but it's only the energy that's easy to, to account for. So mostly we're looking at scopes one and two and then we had to think about well what's a diocese actually responsible for what can it actually count and really from the diocesan point of view it's their build it's their office buildings it's their parishes it's their schools in the uk that they have really direct responsibility for and then diocesan charities and religious orders we we think probably they have to report for themselves because they're not always under the diocese direct control. So when we're doing a carbon footprint, we're looking at uh, the office buildings, the parishes and the schools, not necessarily the religious orders. So there's often a lot left out of the calculation that's worth thinking about that. And then we had to think about what do we actually have data for? Um, and over the years, we can put in new processes to collect more data and it can become more accurate. But at the moment, we're finding it very difficult to get information on things like uh, waste and water and refrigerants. And that might be that we start collecting that data a little later. And at the moment, we're really focusing on electricity use in buildings and fuel use in buildings and our, our travel um, because we can get that data quite easily. So there's a lot still to come, I think. And I think this is why it's so interesting when we look at the language that different dioceses are using around their carbon targets. Uh, some are saying carbon neutral, some are saying net zero, some are looking at science-based targets. And 
this isn't to say any are better or worse because everybody's trying very hard and doing the best they can um but they do all mean slightly different things and it's it, it, it's good to know that so we can compare how how people are going about it and even those that haven't set a direct target are still doing things so um quite a few of the dioceses have started to look at energy auditing all of their buildings so that they can see which ones are uh the most um uh, the most carbon intensive and what they can do about it and i think it's really important to say that you do not have to have a carbon footprint to do useful things people can make really useful action without a carbon footprint so um the dioceses are trying hard so uh i think i've been well under time there but that was a quick whistle stop tour of what's going on in the uk and some of the guidance we've produced so uh, i'll stop there and uh, leave any discussion about net zero etc for the q a thank you uh, edward my apology for not pronouncing your surname properly i have been reminded to pronounce it as dk thank you no as... you guess. you're fine okay thank you <laughs> So, uh, yeah, like uh, Edward mentioned that we are well over uh, under time, but I think that will give us a lot of time for us to, uh, in the Q&A session, for discuss for, uh, to, discuss, to, to discuss further. But uh, I have uh, also noted that not many people have um, put in any put in questions because I, I, as I mentioned, this is not a heated session. Uh, it is a cooling session. So I guess... Uh, people are uh, sort of uh, uh, re reducing the temperature a bit. No? And we thank to our first two speakers who are able to do that. Uh, we move on to our next speaker who is from India. And uh, she is uh, Dr. Priyadashini Kave, who will be sharing on decarbonizing organization in India. Now, Priya is the founder and managing director of uh, Samochi Envirotech, a social enterprise that promotes environmentally sustainable energy and lifestyle products. Priya holds a PhD in physics from University of Pune, and she has worked on decentralized organic ways to fuel technologies as well as devising and promoting strategies for low carbon sustainable urbanization. She is also a founder member and a member of the board of directors of Clean Energy Assess Network in India and national convener of the Indian Network on Ethics and Climate Change. Priya has won numerous national and international awards, including the Aston Award for Renewable Energy and the World Technology Award in Environment category in 2005. And I'm very sure that uh, many of us are, all of us are keen to hear from Priya. So over to you, Priya. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, this has been an interesting session for me because I normally don't get to uh, hear so much in depth about what is happening in other countries. So thank you very much for involving me in this uh, webinar. Uh, I will talk about the work that we are doing uh, in India, uh, focused primarily on uh, not-for-profit academic organizations. Uh, for um, uh, decarbonizing their campuses. So this is uh, not uh, specifically focused on faith-based or religious organizations, but in general, organizations um, across the not-for-profit spectrum, which are working on various uh, social, environmental, and educational causes. Uh, the journey started uh, in 2007, uh, when I developed a personal carbon footprint calculator for urban Indians. Uh, 
because uh, india is a country which has a developed india and a developing india uh, as a as a part of it um, so this was focused uh, in fact most of this work has been focused uh, towards the developed india so to say whose uh, carbon emissions or greenhouse gas emissions are higher uh, than the developing india so this was primarily focused on urban indians and i developed it as a part of a, a course that i was teaching on living with climate change i realized that when the students did their own calculation that changed their outlook towards climate change and therefore we then devised a workshop around this calculator uh, which we called climate friendly lifestyle workshop and started doing these workshops with various uh, community groups um, corporate groups uh, uh, ngos and so on um around 2010 11 uh, as the in the developed world uh, the business community suddenly started going for declaring their um, carbon emissions and taking on uh, targets for reducing uh, carbon emissions etc uh, as you may be aware in india there is a huge uh, uh, business uh, um, uh, community which is primarily uh, mainly in the it sector which is primarily providing services for multinational companies so these small companies started getting inquiries about their carbon accounting data and there was hardly any uh, infrastructure at that time in india to help them do that so some of them started approaching me ngos also started engaging with uh, climate change and uh, they also started approaching me so from that we developed a sort of a toolkit for providing carbon accounting support for corporates and ngos uh then came this idea of academic campuses i live in a city which is uh, uh, fondly called the oxford of the east it's a city full of academic institutions and we started uh, approaching them um sometimes they were approaching us to uh, educate about climate change and um how do we reduce our carbon footprint etc so from that in 2019 came a, a, a handbook and i'll be talking more about this methodology that we have developed where um, a, a campus of an organization um can uh, plan to go carbon neutral in a participatory way um uh, unfortunately then the covid pandemic hit and most of the works went online education also went online so uh, this has really taken off only uh, since last year um uh, right now uh, we are collaborating with a couple of um, uh nation wide organizations so that we can take this idea across india uh, and i am also offering an online course on basic carbon accounting because we need people uh, in various sectors who have that um uh, climate lens to look at their own carbon emissions and from that perspective um uh, there is a lacuna Uh, there are no degree courses or diploma courses around this topic so we have launched this online course so this has been the journey overall uh, in a way i would uh, say that we have been ahead of times because uh, we were talking about carbon neutrality and organizations trying to reduce their carbon emissions much before even the um, uh, the the paris agreement was signed uh this is the link to our uh, personal carbon footprint calculator it is very india specific but i invite all of you to try it out um uh, and i would be happy to collaborate with anyone uh, i can share the logic of this calculator you can change the india specific parts to your country specific components and it can become a personal carbon footprint calculator for urban areas in your countries so uh, please feel free to contact me for this and try it out uh, the website uh, is also given there um in uh, 2015 paris agreement was signed and then india's commitments to um, paris agreement under the ndc came uh, the country has decided to go net zero by 2070 and then there are several other commitments uh, which are around increasing 
um, uh, non-fossil power generation, basically with emphasis on renewable energy and also increasing carbon sequestration through increasing uh, green area. And an interesting idea that has come up uh, since last year is this mass movement on lifestyle for environment, um, life uh, in short. So uh, the way I look at it is that we have um, now uh, nationally um, fairly realistic and strong commitment, uh, but there is also a tacit admission that only the government and businesses cannot achieve this. People's action will have to come into play if the country has to reduce its carbon emissions, and that is where the life movement comes in. Uh, what has happened because of this is that many uh, businesses, civil society organizations, academic institutions over the last uh, year or so have suddenly uh, decided or have been encouraged to contribute to this countrywide effort and take on their own targets for going low carbon or carbon neutral. And we were sort of placed at the right uh, um, uh, time and the right place uh, in a way. Uh, and therefore, um, a lot of action is now happening in India um, uh, with the tool that we have developed. Uh, what is special about our approach? Actually, there are various um, um, consultants who also provide guidance on going carbon neutral. But their approach is that they will typically provide technological solutions because they look at your energy uh, profile, energy consumption pattern, and they'll suggest that put the solar system and um, maybe do go in for offsetting and things like that to go carbon neutral. Our focus has been on participatory approach because I believe that if academic institutions are going carbon neutral, this is a huge opportunity for climate change education to happen with the uh, uh, campus community. If uh, NGOs or civil society organizations are going car carbon neutral, then this embeds climate change thinking in their um, own uh, social, political, economic issues that they are working on. And that will help take this knowledge down to people in a very, very effective way. And if religious institutions and parishes, which are not operationally very different from academic institutions and civil society organizations, they have this additional uh, advantage of being able to influence people and really motivate people to become agents of change. Uh, and therefore, uh, a participatory approach, a bottom-up building of understanding of climate change, uh, carbon accounting, and carbon neutrality uh, is what we are focusing on. So in an uh, institution, what we do is uh, we uh, encourage that institution to first form an internal team, which will include uh, people from all stakeholder groups. So in an academic institutions, we have a person from management, a person from teaching community, person from non-teaching community, and students. So all of these together form an internal team. Uh, we then handhold and train them in very basic uh, carbon accounting principles, help them uh, uh, with the data templates for collecting data from their own campus. So it is the people on the campus themselves who do their own carbon accounting. And that process itself starts telling them what are the changes that they can bring about to reduce their carbon emissions. So it sort of evolves into a plan for decarbonization or they can set net zero targets if they want to. Uh, that then leads to a time bound plan and a budget associated with that. And then it's a matter of implementing that plan and keep on monitoring it internally, as well as time to time uh, taking help from external agencies. So that is the overall approach uh, that we have taken. We are interacting with people in informal settings, informal settings online. There are no barriers. Uh, if a community, if a group is really interested in going for this, there are various ways in which we can help them, mentor them uh, to get onto this track. So how does this pathway actually work? Um, as I said, as mentors, our team and the team within the organization, they work together to develop data collection templates. Uh, we help them with uh, carbon accounting um, uh, worksheets 
excel sheets where all the calculations are already embedded so they don't have to bother too much about that they just have to fill in the data and they'll get a fairly um, uh, user friendly picture of their carbon accounting um, uh, we are finding and as the previous speaker also said uh, the way the accounting tools are structured, typically the focus is on scope one and scope two, but it is the scope three where most of the uh, emissions happen. So we encourage our groups to map as much of the scope three emissions as possible. Uh, the baseline carbon accounting typically shows that um, there uh, uh, it is electricity usage on, on campuses. Uh, and buildings, uh, fuels that are used uh, either uh, in, in the Indian context, it is primarily uh, most of the, many of the academic institutions, many of the residential schools, etc. there will be cooking happening on campus. Uh, fuels are being used for vehicles owned by the organization. And then uh, most of the emissions come from people commuting to the location, um, other outstation travel and waste management. Waste management is uh, a challenge uh, in India uh, most of the places. Uh, what we have added in, which carbon accounting tool typically doesn't have, is we also do a baseline mapping of carbon sink because the organizations that we work with, it could be uh, college or university campuses. And I think the same might be true with some of the religious institutions. If you have land and that land often has natural ecosystems. So those natural ecosystems are also acting as carbon sinks for you. And that also needs to be mapped and accounted for. Uh, so that is a component that we have included in this process, which is not there in the uh, typical carbon accounting process. Um, as people go through this uh, data collection and uh, understanding the calculations that are emerging, they themselves start uh, getting these questions in their mind uh, and start seeking answers. Uh, are we using electricity or fuels unnecessarily? Can the daily visitors, especially students and teachers, can they carpool? Uh, can they use even public transport? Can outstation travel be avoided or reduced, which is very much possible nowadays with these uh, online uh, ways of having a lot of meetings. Uh, waste minimization, which uh, uh, is uh, basically a behavioral change that is required. Uh, segregating the waste that is generated is very, very important. Absorbing the organic waste within the campus uh, so that it doesn't leave the compound at all. And that is very much possible One where people can compost it, they can convert it into biogas, whatever is the need for the campus, uh, some energy uh, requirement can be fulfilled. And the inorganic waste must be handed over to um, uh, uh, recyclers who are uh, trustworthy. So those are the systems that they all, they themselves start coming up with and we help them identify service providers, trainers, and so on. How to enhance existing carbon sinks? There may be little forested areas, some water bodies. How do you enhance them so that they start absorbing more uh, carbon dioxide? Also we help them with um, technical information there. So most of these things that I'm talking about so far are related to basically changing the way you behave and changing the way you operate, which doesn't really cost that much. The costs only come when the technological interventions come in, and that is that has to be the last step. First, you reduce carbon emissions as much as possible by making changes within the organizational operations. Then one can think about whether we can have rooftop solar systems or a windmill or a hybrid system for electricity generation. How can we uh, reduce our water consumption? Can we treat our wastewater and reuse it? And uh, the waste management, the more uh, technologically intensive solutions can also be implemented if required. So that is the pathway uh, that we are uh, follow, uh, we are sort of encouraging them to follow. 
um uh, of course then the uh, idea of setting a target date, date for carbon neutrality comes which is uh, a good thing to do because that gives you some sort of a objective to work towards but personally and i also keep talking to these people that what is more important in this case is the journey and the fact that so many people who are connected with the organization are getting into that climate aligned thinking mode that is a bigger win than whether you actually become carbon neutral with that on paper or not uh, but having a target date allows you to put in a time bound action plan uh, it also helps in raising funding if required and uh, then as i said implement monitor uh periodic audits can be carried out by external agencies just to confirm that you are on the right track so um this is how we are working with several organizations here in india uh, right now and i feel that this methodology can be adapted to any developing country situation um and uh, we can sector by sector forget about the industries and governments but within the non profit uh, uh, sort of range of organizations and academic organizations uh, sector by sector if we start moving towards low carbon or um, uh, 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 carbon neutral pathways that we have uh, uh, sort of domino effect in other sectors also uh, so that's the belief with which uh, we are working and um, any uh, additional information i would be very happy to share you can also find some information on the two websites that i have given here my email is also there uh, thank you very much thank you priya that was really a very uh, inspiring work that you have shared with us and indeed you are a great innovator and uh, also a very generous uh, contributor and in in, in that uh, you are willing to share with us uh, all the uh, all, all this uh, systematic structure and a program that you have worked with i think i will leave uh, there's quite a lot of uh, requests uh, in the in the group chat i will i will leave to later on when we uh, go on to our q and a session so now we will move on to our last speaker uh, she is from my own country malaysia miss madeline chiang kailing now madeline will be sharing on decarbonizing parishes in malaysia a case in point like edward from the catholic church perspective madeline is the head of the friends of creation ministry in the church of divine mercy in penang Uh, just to let you know that the Church of Divine Mercy was featured in Vatican News in 2021, pledging to be the greenest parish in Malaysia and beyond. And I believe we will hear from her on the on this journey. Now she is also the coordinator from the Penang State Creation Justice Commission of the Diocese of Penang, a global supply chain practitioner. She chose. early retirement from a multinational company to focus on caring for our common home as she feels strongly that we should act now and walk the talk to ensure a sustainable future for our children and beyond please welcome madeline over to you madeline hi 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 everyone thanks yeah uh, margaret for introducing me So um over here my session I'm just representing a lay person um to share the actual practices of a church who pledge as a green parish as what mentioned by the Margaret uh, which we try to do as much as we can to operate under a low carbon and in a more ecological way yeah so straight to the point this is the church of divine mercy located in Sungai Ara by the pass Penang This is actually quite a new church that just started operating in 2010, one of the newest in Penang. We actually have a solar panel here, okay, on the rooftop. Um and and this panel actually are enough to provide the power for the usage of this entire church, yeah. So I think I covered the scope one. <laughs> I'm learning a new things here. And um maybe Um, how how it started? It was in 2012. We actually had a new priest. His name is Father Martin Alando. 
on that time, he already realized the importance of installing solar panels. Solar panel. So he contacted TNB. TNB is Tenaga National Bharat. In English, it's called Malaysia National Energy Limited. So during that time, TNB is offering the fit in tariff program, means we actually earn income by selling the solar energy back to the TNB. So according to Father Martin, TNB advised us to build the solar panel as an additional platform on top of our flat rooftop. Uh, instead of putting, you know, on this stunting rule, uh, with this method, somehow TNB are able to provide us a better buying rate. So he, he did it, right? So this is a closer look of uh, our panel, solar panel. This is the top view and this is the, the bottom view. Yeah. So in terms of finance, you all might have the questions, you know, how can we get money on that? Actually, we didn't have much proper problem. It's a blessing because it was supported from the new building fund budget. Yeah. And um, this is actually what I'm showing here is the uh, actual electricity bill of uh, Church of Divine Mercy in short form, we call it CDM. And the actual solar power sales to the TNB. So I just take 2018 and 2019, you can see that our spending of the electricity bill is about 42,000 to 43,000, but the sales of the solar power to TNB is 48,000 to 51,000. So net net, we actually earning, we have a surplus of 6K to 7K. So I'm not sure what is the right term. So can I consider uh, CDM as a carbon neutral church? Yeah. So many terms has been using just now. And 2020, if you all can remember, that is the MCO timing. So MCO, during MCO, um, all the church stopped having the uh, public masses from March onwards. And with this, actually, you know, no different for CDM. We also uh, closed down and we have only minimum uh, staff working. And we also have a minimum crew people, you know, a small crew of people preparing the online mass. With this, actually, our electricity bill dropped like about half. Our usage of electricity dropped by almost half a month. And with that, we have a cheaper bill. But the solar panel power sales do not reduce, right? I mean, you know, we are grateful to have the sun. The sun is always there. And we are still selling it back with the same amount of money, which is about four to five K a month. And with that, actually, uh, you don't see the number here because it's only January and September. So in actually, we have like 25 to 30 K of surplus a year annually. So it means that, you know, we spend our electricity bill about one K to two K, but we are earning four to five K. So every month we have two to three K around that which is an extra income for Church of Divine Mercy. And with that, we are actually able to survive through the MCO period because it's enough to pay the basic expenses of the church. In, during that time, there are so many churches actually running out of cash. And because we stopped all the public donations, you know, people don't come to mass, we couldn't get the collection. So this is actually the benefit that we see uh, during the MCO. So this is, you know, showing you the actual case uh, of how we are doing it. And this is the uh, TND website. Uh, you can check what is the solar program that they are offering today. Three years ago, uh, they had the net metering program, which I'm using it for my house. How it works is that uh, the TNB will calculate monthly of my electricity usage versus the solar power export. If my solar panel produce more power than my usage, the surplus will be kept at the grid, uh, at the TNB for my usage within 12 months. If I don't use it, um, it will reset after 12 months. So for the past three years, I basically don't have to pay electricity bill, except when I have visitors staying at my home. My electricity bill is about $10 to $30 a month when I have uh, visitors staying at my home, Chinese New Year, Christmas, things like that. My sisters came over to my house. And um, in my house, uh, I installed 15 panels and the cost is about 26 k So I should be able to get back my return of investment in about five years' time. Um, the panel is Jinko panel, Jinko brand, and the inverter is a Huawei inverter. 
And the supplier that I'm using is Sunny Sky. Don't know whether you can see, you cannot see in close up. Sunny Sky is a company um, and um, they have a branch in Penang and their headquarters is actually in KL. Um, in fact, they was telling me about the solution learning from them. Um, he's saying that if anyone of, you know, if I have friends or any one of you have businesses with big space, like if you have one acre or more, whether the roof or you want to build it as a car park or things like that, a solar panel supplier, not only the one I'm using, but I think generally, uh, they can build for you uh, under amortization uh, or with a partnership program, means you don't have to take money out. Uh, the supplier would invest and they will sell the power to TNB in return or maybe you know, to certain housing, they have certain program. And in fact, you might also get a portion of the income it depends on the negotiation you have with the supplier. Um, even if you don't have a return, I will say that this can be part of your company ESG implementation. I know there was a discussion about ESG, but this will be a real decarbonizing effort, not the greenwashing that was highlighted by Amina and Matt. Okay, so um, I will not go through in details, but just share with you uh, this Sunview. They also have this uh, capex. So this is the zero capex program, like. What, like what I have just mentioned. And this is the payout front program, which is like the one that I did uh, for my house. Lah. Yeah. Okay. So the solution of renewable energy is already in Malaysia. So I, be I believe Gary, right, is correct, right? It's already available. And I'm just thinking, so what are you waiting for? Let's go for it. Yeah. Decarbonizing your home, your companies, your church. Yeah. And besides talking about decarbonizing effort, direct decarbonizing effort, I also would like to share with you what else uh, CDM is doing um, for our common home, to take care of our common home. So this is the solar panel. Below the solar panel, we actually um, um, set up a rooftop vegetable garden started in 2020. And in this garden, a team of us learn to plant different kinds of vegetables. So in this picture, you can see this is the red amaranth and this is the cabbage. Yeah, managed to grow some cabbage. And we have also grown brinjals, uh, many types of beans, siu pak choy, kai lan, chai sim, ginger, turmeric, chili, and many, many more. And we grow it ecologically, yeah? not the chemical pesticide and all that. And um, the harvest is to give to B40 families. So this is more on educating people for adaptations, you know, food securities and, and all that. So we want to show people that if you have no land, Penang is an expensive city that, you know, land is expensive. You can always, you know, build it, I mean, I mean grow your veggie in your balcony and all that. So we are all build, uh, uh, grow our veggie in pots and things like that. Yeah, so it's uh, easy for people to follow. So um, you can see that at the back here, there's this uh, black tank, right? This is actually a wind harvest water tank. It was DIY also by Father Martin uh, with a few helpers from the church. They installed gutter. So there are gutters. Okay, can you see my pointer? Yeah, ah, okay. So they installed gutters here, panel. Panel is slanting down. So the gutter is collecting the water and this water channel it to the water tank. And it's actually channeled down, so they are piped somewhere here. And we are using it to water uh, our vegetables uh, here. And also some surplus of the rain harvest also were used for the ground uh, compound, the garden uh, at, the, at the ground level in this church. So uh, I actually prepared a two minutes uh, video clips to summarize what Church of Divine Mercy has been doing to promote the ecological living. So let me show you.
So that's the end of my presentation. And I would say that, you know, we really hope that everyone can work together to take care of our common home. And if simple people like us in CDM, Church of Divine Mercy can do this, so do all of you. We pray for a good solution for a better world. Laudato si, min senior. Praise be to you, my Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Madeline, for the uh, wonderful work that you are sharing with us and also the video. I'm very sure it, it has it inspired a lot of us, particularly from the parishes who are aspiring to be uh, going towards the journey to another uh, CDM of uh, Penang. And I'm, uh, I, I like to uh, just... Perhaps a lot of people later on will, will ask you uh, on uh, what are the challenges and how do you produce so many medallions uh, of uh, this Penang to make this uh, a success. And uh, so we will now move on into the um, Q&A session. And uh, as I look at the, uh, the group chat that uh, has been on there. There's not many questions because I think everybody, every speaker has uh, really uh, given such an excellent presentation and they really have um, put everybody in trance that they forgot to ask the question or they, they are looking forward to uh, getting more information from, from, from all of you. So let me just... Um, look into the fact that uh, I, I like to go into first Priya. There's quite a lot of uh, comment and uh, not, not just comment. I think they want to know more about the uh, carbon calculator and also the online courses, uh, whether you can share uh, further and uh, give more information on how to get this uh, two instrument and also and the course and how to work with you so that uh, we can also uh, use that to for our uh, for for our project or for our actions here at home and in other places. So, uh, Priya, can uh, yeah, uh, over sure. to you. Although you have written there, but I think it uh, for for all everybody to to be uh, because some of them may not be reading the the uh, group chat. So you can share again uh, through here. So um, I have put the uh, website link in chat. So I would request people to uh, look at that. Uh, the uh, carbon footprint calculator is uh, freely accessible to everyone. Uh, but as I said, it is designed with certain assumptions which are very specific to urban India. So it may not give the right answer uh, if you are using it in other countries, but it will still give you a ballpark idea because I mean, across Asia, we are not that different uh, in terms of uh, lifestyles and um, other uh, issues. So at least for the uh, Asian uh, people, uh, it will give you a ballpark idea of what kind of a personal carbon footprint at your level or your family level you have. But as I mentioned, I reiterate, uh, the logic of the calculator is open source. Um, uh, there are, I mean, those calculations uh, I can share with anybody. You will just need to follow that logic and replace. So, for example, electricity um, related emission factor for India will be different from Malaysia because the combination of technologies used for electricity generation is different. Similarly, the waste related emissions in India will be different from those in Malaysia. So, those numbers will have to be changed. The logic more or less will should work uh, for across Asia. So, it's not a huge task. I think any academic um, uh, uh, organization can take this up. It can be a good student's project. Uh, the course on carbon accounting is more, I mean, universal. The carbon accounting tool is applicable everywhere. The course is designed with the Indian context, but anybody can take it and learn the uh, methodologies. Uh, it is not a very hardcore carbon accounting course as such. It is more to convey the basic concepts 
and basic calculations so that somebody who is talking to a carbon auditor will know what the auditor is talking about at least that level of understanding is what we are aiming to build uh, that is a paid course uh, also available through the same website from where the um, uh, the the carbon calculator is hosted so those links i have shared in chat thank you priya and i like to just uh, say that uh, we really praise all the effort of our speakers in the decarbonization decarbonize decarbonizing uh, actions in their respective places. And uh, as I mentioned, there's not many questions, there's no question actually being asked because um, I think it's so clear cut, but there is one uh, request from Kennedy. Uh, he like to ask this question directly to you face to face. I guess that is uh, more impactful. So uh, Kennedy, uh, you can uh, proceed to ask your question. Okay. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, thank you to all the speakers for uh, the very insightful presentations. Excellent work. Uh, I actually have a question for each one, so I'll go in turn. Uh, starting with Magdalene. Uh, uh, I, I'm a community activist. It's really impressive uh, what you have done at CDM. In, uh, I believe it's in Sumaira. Yes. Yeah, it's somewhere I grew up. I grew up at a long time ago. Uh, so my, my question to you is, um, how much of the effort that you have put in at CDM, uh, especially in terms of installing the rainwater housing system, the solar panels, and as well as the community garden, was done by volunteers, or was most of it done by, uh, like in your case, uh, the contractors of Sunview? Uh, was it a community effort, and, and what was the response from the community? Thank you. Yeah, so for the water tank, it's a community effort. In fact, uh, the priest is like an engineer. He managed to do it and with some, you know, community. All the parishioners uh, helped us. Uh, and then the uh, rooftop garden, also same. Uh, it's, it's really uh, a, a team of us that we did it. In fact, uh, it's not a very, um, place. it's like, it's not a convenient place. The, the final floor, we have a lift up three floor, but the final floor, we have to climb stairs. And we are actually taking bricks, like thousand bricks up like that. <laughs> okay. So the shelf, everything we, we manually take up. Yeah. So it's a community effort. Uh, but of course, the solar panel, they need contractor. That one cannot be a volunteer and community effort. So that one is done by, uh, I can't remember who is the contractor name, but it's contractor with the PNB, the standard things done. And then uh, they did everything. So we pay for it. Yeah. Was it a difficult process with the contractors, or is it relatively easy for for people to to go to the contractor and get them to help you? Um. Okay. I believe not much a problem. Uh, actually, when they built that, I was not there. Uh, Father Martin is is the the person and and the chairperson on the church on that time. Uh, but from what I hear, uh, it's not really a problem. It is quite a, a smooth process. Not a problem. Yeah. For, for my house, because I also did right, for my house is also quite a smooth pro process. And until today, the performance is still good. No issues. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, Margaret, may I ask another question? Yeah, yeah you okay. may proceed. Uh, this one's for Edward. Uh, Edward, uh, I was fascinated by the, the block diagram uh, of how you mapped the carbon, uh, carbon usage or the footprint of all the faculties or buildings. Can you elaborate on that process a little bit more and, and share whether it was a challenging thing or it's something relatively easy to, to do? Sure, thank you. Uh, the, the diagram itself uh, was just clicking a button on an Excel spreadsheet. So uh, <laughs> that was quite simple. But um, the, the information that goes into it um, is things like uh, gas readings, electricity, water meters, um, as much scope three as we could collect. So things like employee travel, um, flights, uh, conferences, even things like host hotel stays for the academics and, and that sort of thing. Um, and once you've got all that information, um, like Priya was saying, you then sort of convert it all into uh, the, the, uh, the conversion factor for how much carbon that uses. And then that gives you a row of numbers. Then you put that into tons and then, and then it's just all in a spreadsheet and you, you, you click the button essentially but um uh i think it's it's worth saying that every time you add a new variable it changes the picture a little bit so if you're missing a piece of data it might seem like one building's much more than the other and then you introduce i don't know flights or something and then the, the picture changes so um all of this stuff is really useful to give an idea of 
of where the effort needs to be made but it's, it's not a perfect picture but it's enough to get people um motivated i think i think that's thank you the, the reason i asked is because we work um, a lot with school children in my area there are five schools approximately three and a half thousand students and we're trying to develop a technological approach to getting students to see their impacts and their footprints so i'm really interested in this visual approach uh, and I'm wondering whether the Excel spreadsheet is proprietary or whether there's a version we can, we can adopt. Uh, and, and then I'll go to my next question, just related uh, to Dr. Priya. Uh, well, all, all the guidance is in the, uh, is freely available. And uh, like I say, it's just a, a click on an Excel spreadsheet. So uh, yeah, it's all Excellent. out there. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Priya, I'm really interested in uh, the, climate tracker um, and we, we were looking at develop, developing something similar uh, but in an app format uh, again because the uptake in Malaysia the, the climate conversation climate awareness is extremely low but people here do like technology they, they do like uh, gamified experiences and so mm -hmm. um, what was the process of, of creating that app uh, and um, and was it, um, is it very expensive, very time consuming, or is there a fast track way to do it? So uh, this was uh, a rather long journey. I mean, initially when I made the calculator to use in my classroom, it was one piece of paper with uh, equations and students had to use their calculator to uh, do the calculations, plug in their data. Then I made it into an Excel file where the equations were already embedded in it. You just had to put in data and the calculation and some kind of a graphic uh, also comes out. Uh, then uh, the app idea had been around, but I didn't have money to do it. And I wanted to keep it free and open source. Uh, but uh, it was uh, uh, first, uh, there was a group of people uh, who came together in my city to develop a plan for carbon neutrality for the city. And we created a website for that. And as a part of that project, the first attempt was made to convert it into an app. That was tough because uh, somebody was paying some, uh, I mean, X was paying to Y and I was Z uh, who didn't have direct contact with those guys who were working on the app. Uh, it became rather a tedious process. But then um, that project ended, the website also went defunct. Uh, but there is this other group, Climatora. Uh, this is a new startup. Uh, uh, their focus is on climate change and environmental education. So they approached me and uh, they have done everything. So I have just given them the logic. Uh, the expense has been borne by them. They have developed the website and the uh, uh, app. I gave in inputs which were taken on readily. So we have tried to make it as user-friendly as possible. Even more um, uh, user-friendliness can be brought in as we go ahead. But uh, uh, fortunately for me, it hasn't cost me anything to do that. But if you can, and that is the lesson, I guess, uh, if uh, that kind of a collaboration emerges. I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of IT companies in Malaysia who are also um, always looking to do something which is good for people, even if it is to advertise themselves. Uh, I think it would be good to take help of them because they have the knowledge how to make user-friendly apps uh, and just go for it because this is a very, very effective way of uh, getting the message out to people. And thank you for the answer. Have you seen a, a good uptake of users, people yep, uh, yep, adopting yep, it? Yep. Yeah, we, we launched it uh, just about, uh, I think, a couple of months back. And we already have a few thousand people uh, who have already used it. Um, we only started um, uh, sort of doing some social media promotion, etc. around it about a month ago or so. Uh, so the uptake has been pretty good. I'm also using it. Uh, I mean, we, we are doing those workshops around climate friendly lifestyle where 50 uh, people are there in the room who use the app simultaneously. Uh, so in those workshops also, it is now getting used. So uh, I'm, uh, I, I think the response has been pretty good so far. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, happy to hear that. Uh, Henning, this question is for you. Uh, on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, I was with a group of people 
uh, on, a, on a UN program. And one of them, a couple of them, one of them was from Indonesia. Uh, and we got into this conversation about the role of religion in climate action. And so we were talking about this and that, and I was talking about the Malaysian context. And uh, he, he asked me, he said, you know, uh, do you think religion is a powerful tool for climate action? And then I gave him a real life example from my place. So we, we operate a river restoration program uh, and along the river, there's one mosque. It's right next to the river. For four years, we have tried porting the, the mosque community to come and help us. Their, their, their karya is about, I think, uh, 4,000 people. Uh, we only managed to get two people, you know, which was uh, quite disheartening. And, and I said, you know, I, um, I, I, I look at religion as a, a, a thing that has failed to do what it's supposed to do. Because we look at uh, the proof is in the pudding. And so if religion was working, we wouldn't be having all the problems that we have, whether it's from ordinary people littering on the streets, littering on the, uh, in the river, or the politicians. Uh, I would like your perspective on what do you think, uh, I, I listened to your talk, but uh, do you think religion has failed to do what it should do? Or is the failure uh, with their adherence of religion, regardless which? Okay, thank you so much, Kennedy. Um, something feels in the our action is somehow it is not easy. Uh, the leaders of faith uh, involved directly to the action, but like the leaders of the uh, faith is think tank. So they are is behind our action. Usually, it's like that because. Uh, we always uh, invite them for the strategic discussion and also advocacy. The example, if we are going to the parliament, so we bring some of the multi-faith leaders and they are like the parliament is like silent. But if we bring the uh, NGOs or young generation, they are, didn't hear about it. So the leaders of the um, religion is powerful. But we cannot um, uh, discuss and use, excuse me, and bring them in everything that we did. But we bring for the strategic things and also think them. And number two, uh, especially for the uh, mining, not only for the leaders of the faith, but also many uh, activists be careful to do action for the related with mining in Indonesia because um, we know that um, some of uh, behind uh, the mining uh, development, they have like a bigger support than sometimes as uh, we make activists in Indonesia is um, slowly and be careful to be action. And one thing that I said before close that uh, in Indonesia, church, a Catholic, uh, Hindu, Buddha, and Muslim, like working in the climate justice is very uh, full team. But sometimes if we discussing like humanitarian or uh, two things that's very uh, useful for the issues. Number one about the humanitarian and number two is about the climate justice. That every uh, religion and also um, indigenous people can join it together. Thank you very much for that answer. I'm also glad you mentioned uh, indigenous people uh, because they have their own spirituality and yes. faith. Uh, so that's an important part. And I think I answered my own question when I asked Edward to explain what the Catholic Church was doing uh, in the UK and what uh, it, the Catholic Church is doing in Penang, for example. So uh, it was a, kind of a strange one to ask the question and it was already been answered. Thank you very much. Back to you, uh, uh, to the moderator. Right. Uh, thank you, Kennedy. I think we have just enough time for two questions. And uh, since Henning is uh, uh, still uh, still hot on her responses. Uh, the question was asked by Claire, what does Green Faith intend to do at COP28? Uh, we will, number one, we will campaign about the climate justice, not only for climate justice uh, perspective from many religions. That is uh, number one. And number two, uh, we will uh, advocate 
about this top call. This is my hiker of our uh, vision, our action at the from now until uh, at the uh, COP 20X. And uh, do you have plans to expand it to Malaysia? Yes, uh, we now in the Asia, we have the Indonesia and we have in Japan. So hopefully uh, we will continue in India and also Malaysia and Philippines. Oh, that's good. Huh? We, we, that is an extra. Hopefully. Yeah, thank you, Taz, to us. And uh, the last question that, that is put forward to Priya is that asking you whether you can please comment on the embedded carbon footprint of solar panels and the problem of dealing with the batteries. Uh, these two issues are often raised. So would you be able to respond to that? Thank you. Yeah, sure. So, um, I, I mean, I'm a physicist by training, so I keep track of what is happening uh, in the technology sector. Uh, about 10 years back, this was true that you would be uh, generating more emissions in uh, producing a, a, a solar-based uh, electricity generation system than what the uh, system would save for you. But that is no longer true. Uh, the processes of making solar panels have uh, increased in efficiency, um, reduced the waste uh, in the process. Also, the battery technology has advanced considerably. Now, mostly we are using lithium uh, batteries, uh, which are far more efficient and uh, the capacity is also higher than the earlier uh, lead acid batteries. These are maintenance-free, uh, long-lasting. Um, also, uh, I mean, technologically, these batteries are recyclable. So it's just a matter of putting in place the system for collecting and recycling. Uh, already across the world, there is more recycling capacity already established now than the uh, battery waste that is being generated. Um, in standalone systems like photovoltaic uh, uh, so rooftop solar systems, for example, uh, it is relatively easy. I mean, all our cell phones also, we have lithium batteries. But to collect all these batteries and put them into recycling is a big task. But uh, to um, use the um, rooftop solar systems when the batteries uh, will need to be changed. These are uh, like large uh, battery uh, packs and the investment is fairly high. So collecting these batteries and putting them in recycling will be relatively logistically easier. Uh, same thing with uh, EV cars. Um, there is also another interesting idea which uh, is being experimented with in India. Um, in India now, there is a big focus on electric vehicles. Now, these batteries that are put in the vehicles, after 10 years or so, they will lose about 20% of their capacity. So they are no longer useful for vehicles, but the same batteries are still good enough for using in uh, a standalone photovoltaic system. So uh, you have a second life uh, for these batteries. They will be used in those systems and then they will go for recycling. So these type of uh, mechanisms are now coming in, which further reduce the overall um, embedded energy and carbon footprint of the uh, infrastructure that you need for solar power generation. And the waste management issues are also be getting resolved. So technologies are advancing and um, uh, economically it is now making very much very good sense as uh, Magdalene also pointed out. Uh, so I think people should uh, uh, just go for it because the more people start using it as the volumes increase, further investments will come in and further technology improvements will happen. Okay, thank you. And although there are some questions, I think it's all directed to uh, Madeline and she has also responded uh, due to the uh, shortage of time. Uh, I would just uh, like to the speaker to deliver one takeaway for this session into an inspiring, inspiring, inspiring message that can encourage our mission in our home ground to achieve what you have achieved. So can I first start off with uh, Henning as being the first speaker? Yes. Um, so uh, all of uh, religious have 
value in each of their religious, uh, their own. So uh, in each of the value, they can put how to save our planet. Please uh, become stand up and uh, collaboration together between multi-faith, between religious actors, and also from the uh, indigenous people in the world uh, to collaboration save our planet. Thank you. So over to you, it was DK. Thank you. Um, just to say, I think if, if it's true that eight in 10 people on the planet have a religion, then uh, if we can get it right, then the problem's already solved and religions are uh, quite lucky in that they don't have to be political, do they? So we can just say the right thing, we hope. Yep. So next, uh, Priya. Uh, so I would advise everybody that um, uh, look at uh, our own carbon footprint and also the adaptation needs in our neighborhood, because that is also very important for Asia, although that was not the focus of this uh, webinar. Uh, these two things go hand in hand, mitigation and adaptation. Often the solutions are also common. So uh, we have to find the right balance because we are in a unique uh, kind of a situation across the Asian, uh, uh, I mean, this uh, uh, tropical belt, I should say that we are also suffering from the impacts. Um, and uh, uh, as developing countries, our emissions are going up. So we have to find the right balance and implement uh, the um, uh, people-focused uh, solutions. So finally, Madeline. I think, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, okay. sorry, sorry. Um, go all out and do what you can do within your control. Yeah, whatever within your control, we don't complain about the government, but of course we will fight, like the Penang, we fight for the island. And now from three islands, they drop to one island. That is something you can do and install solar panel, whatever you can afford, the solution is already there. And very important, due to the climate emergency, there are things that is not within our control. The only thing you can do is to pray to your faith. We really need to pray for miracle. Pray every day to the God that you believe in. Thank you. Thank you. That's all. Um, indeed, all our speakers have been able to emphasize that uh, multi-faith, uh, religion, uh, organization, religious institution, or academics, all have common goals in educating the community and capacity building in a pathway to decarbonization. Uh, as we know that the United Nations have got a task force uh, in which they bring the faith-based uh, organization and the United Nations for Environment have launched this Faith for Earth initiative in uh, November 2017 with the vision, a world where everything is balanced. And they have recognized that the spiritual leaders, and I like to add in academic leaders like Priya, and all the faith-based organizations are critical to the success of global solidarity for an ethical, moral, and spiritual commitments to protect the environment and God's creation, as in Henning's conclusion remark. Are looking for collaborative partnership through multi-faith approach. So I trust that uh, after listening to all these uh, leaders here and their commitments, we will continue our journey to rehab our Mother Earth. And so with this, my role as the moderator of this round two has uh, come to an end and uh, Thank you very much for the audience uh, uh, coolness that uh, there's not much heated arguments and so on. And uh, I need to hand over to Claire for the conclusion conclusion session. Claire, over to Thank you. Thank you so much, Margaret, for your excellent moderation. Uh, congratulations to the speakers of round two and also again to the speakers of round one and the excellent moderation by Kennedy Michael. Uh, I trust everyone has gained uh, substantially from hearing all their wisdom. I would like now to call upon Bishop Joseph P for some closing remarks 
And then I'll have a few more announcements. So please stay with us. And we have a lovely song to uh, share with you at the end. So please stay on. Bishop Joe, please. Hello. Okay. Dear friends, this truly has been a very inspiring and not just inspiring and really very touching. In fact, in two occasions, thank God that I think on my camera because in fact, I was in tears. And also, thank God that the microphone, most of the microphone are closed also. And it was really a joyful and happy uh, webinar. And the people just laughed at certain occasion where even fireworks came up. But I thought it was just wonderful that we really enjoy this section today. I'm sure for all of you, you too enjoyed this afternoon or this morning, this evening session. I'm extremely grateful to the organizing team and the panels of speakers for the sharing their valuable knowledge and experience. From round one, we learn about the non-negotiables and true and false solutions to the climate crisis. I'm reminded by Pope Francis refer reference to the technocratic paradigm in Laudato Si, which he cited as the one of the causes of current crisis, where technology has become an idol that we worship and which we can we think can solve all our problems. It is imperative that our solutions are life-giving and not life-destroying. That they promote justice and not more inequity. There is so much false news out there and the speakers have shed the much needed light of truth. I trust we have been set free by the truth today so that we will avoid the pitfalls of false solutions. From their sharing, we are able to be critically evaluate schemes and proposals by third parties with a better sense of what is good and not good, what is ecological and what is not. And who are the winners and losers will be in different circumstances. It is good to see that Malaysia is undertaking so many plans of the transition towards a decarbonized economy. I am heartened by the sharing of the panelists in round two, sharing us live examples of good practices that are ecological and therefore very possible and practical for us to undertake from the international to the regional to the local level. I congratulate all the panelists on their work and efforts. I strongly urge all people of goodwill to think carefully about all we have learned today and make the ethical choice to pursue only ecological solutions for the sake of our people, 
our countries, and the world. Let us be as wise as serpents and innocent as doves, and not be lured by the bright lights of technology above all else. Everything has its proper place. Let us always remember that the integrity of the poor and the marginalized, both human and in the nature, should be at the heart of all our decision making. It is our duty to be ecological, and that is to be just, compassionate, respectful of the dignity and sacredness of all living creatures. Let us bow our heads and keep silence. To conclude, we once again allow ourselves to be in this all wonder nature We thank this old wonder God who has given us this mother nature as a gift to us. And all of us are a gift and grace to this mother nature, to all of creation, to our brothers and sisters. As today, the panels of speakers has been a blessing to all, the, all of us who are listening. And may all of us may now turn to become a blessing to all our brothers and sisters, our mother nature. And so let us keep in silence and thanking God for making all of us a gift, a grace, and a blessing. May God continue to use all of us as a blessing to each and every one. Thank you so much, Shukjo, for that blessing upon us all and asking us to be a blessing. Um, we have with us today also another bishop, an Archbishop from Kuching, uh, Sarawak, Archbishop Simon Po. And uh, I wonder, Bishop, Archbishop, if you could just say a few words. Um, it's... Okay, I, I'll be, I'm, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yeah. Archbishop. Thank you very much. I've been following you for the three hours and thank you uh, to all the panelists and all the questions that come in and uh, it clarifies a lot of things. Uh, in, I'm uh, together with Bishop Joseph He, both of us are actually on the island of Borneo. We are in Sarawak, Malaysia. And this is where I think I heard a few times that it came out that the people have, the indigenous people have the solution. These are the people who have been on the land, they're farming the land. So we're looking at project and how we can actually help the people, empower them to a sustainable approach. And uh, all those things that we suggested give us some direction, uh, guidelines, and at the end of the day, we, we may not be able to do high tech, but what we can do is at the level as suggested by the panelists, we do on our own level, uh, what we can do a sustainable agriculture approach, empowering the community, bringing the community back to the village, uh, helping the life uh, through building resilience and so on. We believe uh, all this together, the project can be done. So it's an exciting time. And we pray that uh, from the ind indigenous community that have so much to offer to us, especially they're on the very front the line of people who are in touch with the land, then uh, working together, we can make a difference in the world. Uh, what is important at the end of the day is each of us do the little bit that we can where we are and then the commission, the committee can help us to build on that later on. But we start with where we are. I believe that's very important. And uh, right where we are and be blessed. Thank you very much. And all have been said, I think uh, Bishop Josephie had put it very nicely. And all the panelists, your parting words are already there for us. Thank you very much, Claire. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Archbishop. Thank you. So everybody, yes, um, I always say this uh, in all my in my work uh, over Asia. The world will be changed by people who care. 
Uh, some people care, but they're not in a position to do any, something. Maybe they're too old or they're in hospital or in prison. And some people can do something, but they don't want to. So at the end, it's the people who care. And it doesn't matter as the church, as anyone, we don't make any excuses. We accept our accountability and we do. Whether it's fair or not fair, it doesn't matter anymore. What matters is how much we love. And of course, it is important for us to always remember that our values are non-negotiable. So it's always the marginalized, the last, the least, the lost creation. They always come first. And when we, when those values are non-negotiable, then the pathways forward become very easy. We don't have to get caught in all these sort of um, solutions because at the end of the day, we look at the long-term effects of some of something, whether or not it will be good or not good for the people and the planet. So I thank all of you wonderful participants for staying with us for four hours. Uh, God bless you for your dedication, for your interest. And I pray that, you know, you will continue to, to uh, journey with us and journey with all your own communities uh, towards transforming and ecologizing our world, to save this world and this planet for current and future generations of all life on earth. Okay. So we would like to give to you with this song at the end of the day and uh, ask that you stay in touch with us. Uh, our emails, uh, I think Maria has put them in the chat box. Our email is there. I'll put you on the listserv. Our Facebook is there. If you want to be included in any of our um, communications or promotions, then um, please share with us your contact details. So God bless you all. Be well and uh, take care. <laughs>